So good afternoon, everybody from London, and a very warm welcome to all of you joining the SOAS South Asia Institute's session today, which is on the Tamil Nadu elections, rhetoric, ideology, and alliances, the future of Dravidian politics. Um, as you can see, this event is in aid of the collective fundraising towards the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister's COVID relief fund. Uh, the donations uh, can be made directly to the CMPRF, the government of uh, Tamil Nadu's public relief fund. Uh, you're able to um, uh, directly donate to the fund following our links here on the site. Um, I'm Sanjuk Ghosh, your host, as well as the co, the co convener of the Sanglap Forum, which is um, the discussion forum. Mainly, we have uh, focused for this on electoral politics and culture. So, the today's topic kind of relates to um, the general trend in the national elections in India, which many of you who are familiar with South Asian regional politics as well as national politics know that it's really about a very high pitch political drama and a lot of contestations of political parties as well as a competition of different kinds of promises during elections and after. So um, the, the recent kind of assembly elections uh, in the months of April and May, um, we've seen various phases as well as um, state uh, elections that brings into sharper focus the regional power contestations opposing the majoritarian Bharatiya Janta Party as the ruling parliamentary party. Um, now, following the, the 16th Legislative Assembly election that was held in Tamil Nadu for the 234 constituencies, uh, we will look at the dynamics of that state uh, the, the, the southern state of India. And uh, all our speakers will really reflect on both the past trends in the Tamil political culture, but also comment on the emergence of partisan alliances that is based on caste identity, questions of Dalit identity, the rising uh, focus on, Hindu, uh, on the Hindutva populism as well as issues of governance and more generally on development in the state that emerges from caste-based alliances. Um, so when we started the Sanglap uh, session on uh, this kind of, uh, you know, reflecting on assembly elections that we recently held for the Bengal assembly elections, we had a lot of interest uh, from, from people and they were asking me, you know, whether I'm going to do other states or not. And the first thing that came to my mind is really to look at the southern states. Um, and that is because we don't really want to focus on analyzing so much of the electoral data because the elections are over, but to look at how um, the shifts and the changes in the party system uh, can therefore uh, be shown to, to uh, to really look at the changes in the political system more generally as well. So that is something um, I thought of bringing into this session. But for the Bengal elections, um, the session was held while the election was going on. So there were quite a lot of speculation on data and it was quite speculative as well. But here we want to look at um, and reflect more on how the, the 2019 Lok Sabha elections um, left some kind of footprints as to how the state would therefore cope with the consolidation of majoritarian power of the center uh, and in favor of the BJP as well. So uh, there would be issues uh, around minorities, recognition of minorities in the context of majoritarian values and how these values are therefore reflected in the state level as well. The discussion really comes at a, cru a crucial time when the BJP is also facing some kind of an anti-incumbency sentiment at the state level as well. And there is a strong tendency therefore to consider India as a union of states. And previously, if you go back to our Facebook live session, which is recorded on the Sai uh, Sanglap page, as well as the South Asia Institute page, you will find that we have discussed uh, why states are important and what kind of powers that states do have that uh, enables them to 
to exercise those as well as remain some kind of model of governance. But um, currently, I think for the South, it's, it, it's, it'll be interesting to see how a successful Dravidian model uh, emerges in Tamil Nadu. And, and the first two speakers we have here uh, will reflect on the success of the Dravidian movement in the past, as well as uh, what would be there for the owners of the DMK that you can see on the map on the left uh, is, is the red color coded uh, bit on the map, which shows the extent of the DMK that is the Dravida Munetra Kazagam, uh, and, and how it's managed to mobilize its strength across the state in this assembly election. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Arilan Naganathan, the DMK MLA of Tamil Nadu, as well as the consultant physician to speak on the inclusive Dravidian model of development. Dr. Naganathan is a social activist and physician who is based in Chennai. For over a decade, he has worked to make education, particularly health education, accessible to the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and the backward class communities. He's also the founder of the Youth Org, a nonprofit that works on adequate representation for marginalized communities in the 13 districts of Tamil Nadu. So um, that we're going to also um, move to our second speaker um, who is um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, and Professor uh, M. Vijay Bhaskar from the Madras Institute of Development Studies, who is also the Charles Wallace uh, Visiting Fellow in SOAS and he will speak on the developmental challenges uh, post-election 2021. Uh, we can see here that his main interests, um, at least he would try to bring out today, I'm hoping, on the Dravidian model of development, as well as um, issues that concern the political economy, labor land markets, rural urban linkages, and the kind of transformations that we'll see around the issues of neoliberal India and the transformations there. So the third and the fourth speakers again tie up with uh, very specific concepts of um, the mechanisms of representation in state politics, as well as the political parties, the contests and leadership around that. So we have Dr. Jill Vernier from, who is the assistant professor of political science at Ashoka University, as well as the co-director of the Trivedi Center for Political Data. He is also the co-editor of a forthcoming volume on sociology of elected representatives in India with Professor Christopher Jaffalot and Dr. Sanjay Kumar. And he's going to speak on the recomposition of the DMK elite um, in the third round. The fourth round will be by Dr. Andrew Wyatt, who is the Senior Lecturer of Sociology, Politics and International Studies in the University of Bristol. And you can see um, his, his interests are lined up here, uh, which is to do with national regional politics. And particularly for this session, the regional politics, his interest is mostly on party politics, relig religion, as well as uh, Tamil Nadu. Um, and Dr. Wyatt has also, um, you know, his, his recent and forthcoming publication is also on Tamil Nadu's political pluralism as well as party system changes, which is uh, going to be brought out by Sage. Um, <clears throat> then our final speaker is Selvam. Selvam Tarani Dharan is the co founder of the Oxford Policy Advisory Group, who is also the former youth leader to the World Democracy Forum and United Nations. He will speak on the past, present and future of Dravidian ideology. Um, he's also a multilingual professional with eight years of experience in developing countries to do consultancy with five years of academic experience. And here in, with Selvam, we can see um, his, his focus would be really on the, the issues of social justice, equality, and uh, the impact of Dravidian ideology more specifically on the societal changes 
Uh, finally, I would also welcome Dr. Prabhu Rajendran, who is the vice chair of the World Tamil Organization, to give us some observer's comments and conclude the session with Q&A. So those of you who are participants on this uh, Zoom um, forum, I would request you to put all questions under the Q&A uh, box and to restrict Q&A under chat, which is something that we will pick up from the Facebook Live sessions. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it on to our uh, first speaker, um, <clears throat> Dr. Erlen Naganathan, if you would like to start your presentation, please. And whatever you have to say at the start, that would be great. And Sunil, if we can have the focus on the speakers. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, really uh, overwhelmed by the uh, South Asia Institute to bring up uh, such a topic of discussion, especially uh, there's a constant neglect, especially mainstream narratives about the Dravidian models of development or analysis of a sub-nationalist government electoral politics. So because it has been projected the previous intellectual world that uh, India means Delhi and Delhi means India. I congratulate you Institute that uh, you have started thinking about the boundaries away from Delhi, uh, thinking about Bengal and Tamil Nadu. So that uh, the perspective of uh, regional discourses can be revealed to the world. You are uh, picked up a man straight from the election scenario, uh, dark from the battleground. That too, as a, I have to thank my constituents, the people who made me as their member of legislative assembly, uh, fighting against an ideological platform. Being belonging to the Dravidian stock myself, I faced a direct uh, a candidate from uh, Bharatiya Janata Party BJP, and I had star campaigners uh, from BJP, including Amit Shah and big giants like Smithyani to campaign in my constituency. And Tamil Nadu people, gave a fitting reply of 30,000 votes difference between myself and my BJP candidate. So uh, in 2021, still ideological platform and electoral scenario plays a major role, uh, which is responsible for uh, DMK to bounce back to power after 10 years, because the opposite ADMK, which is also a pseudo Dravidian party, I would say, uh, right on the planks of uh, BJP, uh, people thought that the regional aspiration, state autonomy, their social justice program have been into big danger in the previous ADMK regimen. So they voted uh, DMK for the major revamp of Dravidian ethos into the social and political spheres of social justice, state autonomy, and uh, protection of Tamil identity and culture, which has been the three main plans in which the Dravidian ethos and political parties has been built up by DMK right from its inception from 1949. Before going into that, we talk about the Dravidian model of development. We should be very clear to ascertain to the viewers what is Aryan model is. You know, what is an Aryan model? Uh, we have to do a cut section from Hindu newspaper about the percentage of a PC class in the judicial, Indian judicial system, especially in the Supreme Court. We have to analyze the percentage of the PC class in all the union government secretary post, right from the cabinet secretary, assistant cabinet secretary, which belongs to 97% to 98% in one class. We have to uh, clearly identify the domination of the priestly class in IITs and IAMs, the central institutes or the governing epitomes or any, any central premium institute across the country. We have to also clearly depict the percentage of the priestly class present in media houses, uh, both private media, electronic media, the decision making what used to be put up in uh, in a television news channel or in a mainstream newspaper. So when you do an analysis of the entire Aryan model, which has been depicted as a so-called national model, so the resistance, we come for a tradition of resistors. So what is a Dravidian model? I would explain in simple pyramid form. See, <clears throat> any type of intervention, whether in the form of health or education, percolates down percolates down under to the masses only if there is a social transformation or a civil society transformation takes place. Whether it's going to be a, a political transfer of power or delivering education to the masses or to the health, especially in this caste nation mm -hmm. where the oppression 
as you, as you see, there is various type of oppression across the world. This subcontinent plays a different type of oppression in the form of a hierarchical uh, caste system sanctioned by religious uh, uh, scriptures and people, governing class trying to protect it and implement it and make a way of people adapt to that particular system and thinking that there's a way of life. So in this uh, structure of hierarchical system, which is more prevalent even in modern days in India, uh, we have, uh, now we have to analyze that when the majority of the working class or the survived class or the oppressed classes, or those most backward or the scheduled class or the scheduled tribes, which form 60 to 70 or 80% of this population of this country, civil society transformation have to take place if you want political power to percolate down under, if you want any educational intervention to percolate down under, or if you want any health intervention to percolate down under. Without that civil society transformation, all the benefits of transfer will be limited to the upper cream strata. So if you have a pyramid, when the apex of the pyramid, it's from the elite or the priestly class. And if you have the intermediate caste and the working class, when you have an intervention like this, like the social intervention or political intervention or health intervention, where the majority plank goes to the apex. Okay. When all types of interventions uh, like health and education or political empowerment, only a small percentage goes to the masses at the base. So what is Davidian model is? So Davidian model is nothing but the truth model, giving the same inverted pyramid of delivery, you know, reverse it so that social justice program or regional autonomy or the preservation of subaltern identities forms a similar picture. So where you have the resistance, the resistance naturally will be from the few who, who have been enjoying, continue to enjoy the privileges of oppression based on religious sanctions and based on a uh, caste hierarchical system. So this Dravidian model has its roots, especially this part of the subcontinent, because we have an egalitarian type of uh, way of living. We have Tamil scriptures, especially Tirumur, Tirumula or Kalil Pungundran expressing that uh, humanism, universal brotherhood and fraternity, those ethos have been imbibed. Even in recent uh, Kiradi excavations, which has happened in mid part of Tamil Nadu, we didn't find any type of uh, belief system or idol worship. So it was basically an egalitarian societies where more of uh, Dravidian uh, values and Dravidian history uh, from the Arapa Mogajandaro or to the excavation towns in Kiradi. So some type of egalitarian ethos have been there. So constantly many scholars or many activists have to remember this concept of egalitarianism in various forms in down the history of Tamil Nadu. So we had the Siddha movement, uh, we had Rama Diglar movement, we had Ayodhya Dasaris movement. Uh, uh, every type of movement took place. But, but when it needs for a political changeover, because we have seen migrations of uh, uh, invasions from the outside, uh, especially on various periods down, during only when the British colonization tried to give us a, some sort of shape to this particular entity of project of India. So when the, after the Montek Chels reform took in place, so there was limited elite who took up the major positions. Resistance came from the South, especially from the Madras presidents. So that forms the Dravidian home from Dr. Nadezhin, Dr. by himself, the formation of Justice League, the Justice Party, then who did a political local self-government. It was the first local self-government when compared to the rest of India formed by a non-Congress based on a communal uh, GO, based on egalitarian values, based on uh, removing all these superstitious structures, especially uh, 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 reformations, especially in field of uh, health education. So that forms a political transformation took place. But we need an icon like Periyar to do that civil transformation project very aggressively because the society should move away from superstitions, caste-based, which is linked to every part to the worshiping entities. So that radical transformation needs the self-respecters movement. 
so that the elite non brahmanical orientation only in political sphere converted in the language into the masses so when a uh, dravidian ethos of egalitarian values scientific temper then preservation of uh, cultural identities transfer down transfer down and the masses took up especially in this part of this country masses took up the project of self respect movement so when masses got oriented about their true identity the culture the linguistic movement and uh, women liberation all entities when the indian uh, project of independence came into and we were converted to republic naturally it evolved into a political format so the arise of tmk maybe a default or uh, resistant movement against dk it carried the both social as well as the political program of dravidian ethos into action so the concepts of social justice within the framework of indian constitution and indian republic as an electoral party to participate within the framework of the indian constitution thanks to dr baba saheb ambedkar who based this constitution on principles of equality fraternity and brotherhood and secularism but there was a constant fight from the dmk about regional aspirations it it wanted the uh, pure uh, uh, federal setup to be set into action uh, the state autonomy the dravidian project converted into a state autonomy project uh, to complete federal project complete financial sovereignty health and education so that this pluralistic india can be hold together so that's what the first uh, talk of anand rajasabha he said yes i belong to dravidian stock but we have got something to offer something to offer to this country the the offering was if this country has been set on true federal principles if the country had to uh, move in the lines of social justice understanding and respecting the pluralistic nature like the united states of india maybe this country would have progressed in a much more larger better way and uh, in order to in a, in a in a development model more stronger so that dravidian model of development was always enshrined in the values of all the leaders who took up the major positions in the electoral politics so from the footstep of arangaranna came kalingar see as you know this country is divided into agricultural sector then we have a manufacturing sector then we have the service sector first kalingar took the massive agricultural transformation or agriculture transformation to the masses from the period of 1971 to 1976 if you are able to analyze all the studies on agrarian reforms without any bloodshed there was a transfer of huge fertile lands from the uh, holdings of temples from the holdings of few priestly class from the holdings of few landlords by the land ceding act or tenancy only act it got transferred to the more, most backward as well as uh, scheduled class communities uh, involved in agriculture agriculture production so that's why when you involve the masses especially in country like india when you involve the masses there'll be mass production when before dnk came to power there was a huge famine it had only a two month rations for its people but after a transfer of agricultural uh, uh, production from the masses we were in surplus and with the scientific temper we involved a lot of technology innovations i remember kalinger visited uh, punjab uh, i forgot the prime chief minister's name you want to develop a typical agricultural university similar to what is in punjab in tamil nadu so it was responsible for the coimbatore agriculture university who had found huge innovations in agriculture so here with scientific temper innovations agriculture in one line we have the land holdings have been transferred to the masses and production in excess in came in kalinger was uh, able to uh, give uh, 2000 tons 3000 tons 4000 tons respectively when the rest of india was in famine to karnataka to gujarat and to the northern states so during that 71 76 period as a thousand likes uh, man uh, in my constituency uh, there are 16 housing board or some clearance board or i would say 
gudasai mattu vadiyam in tamil where it will be huts in 971 to 76 kalangar converted all the huts and converted them into flats not about uh, it is about the uh, uh, what do you say the self respect given why are people in hut why can't it be in a flat in a three story building with a separate bathroom with a separate bedroom with a separate hall so when i walked into my constituency when i look into the pictures of the elderly people who fought for this movement i see lot of kalingars photographs among huts now i am meeting the grandsons and granddaughters during my electoral journey they were able to describe how hard his grandfather or grandmother or his uncle fought for this dividend movement especially the various struggles for social justice and anti india agitations by dmk were all in huts so kalinga thought let them give me let them let us give them dignity in order to make them live into into flat tenements so it was acknowledged by many international observers who just who said how could you convert around say 150000 people in huts were converted into building blocks uh, into flat story buildings and imagine the intervention of uh, uh, of removing the hand pulled uh, hand rickshaw into a tricycle rickshaw that type of social intervention was clubbed with the project of livelihood i would say see the health intervention so kalangar in 71 76 brought the uh, famous kannoli uh, thittam in tamil we say because to deliver vision because at the time cataract water speak many under privileged section were not have an access to develop uh, remove their cataract surgery is done and actually the production uh, of their livelihood will limited by 45 to 50 to 60 years so he did huge camps for cataract surgeries in tamil nadu within a span of 2 years around 2.5 2.5 lakh to 3 lakh people got their cataract operated in their uh, rural primary health centers and villages which is very much acknowledged by a german uh, uh, ophthalmologist called cs bog a community ophthalmologist was completely perplexed by the effort of kalingar in removing cataract surgeries so that the productivity of each and every individual increased by 20 20 years or 30 years simple scattered examples i would say take the leprosy eradication program of the center kalingar co-opted the leprosy eradication program into a beggar relief program and he constructed leprosy homes rehabilitation homes where uh, every seven days three days a meal will be given every sunday non vegetarian meal they had a vocational training program for rehabilitation he also constructed schools in leprosy homes so that people of their respective children can be educated he had a doctor and nurse visited in leprosy eradication homes so leprosy was completely eradicated by the central government project along with beggar beggar rehabilitation program so that their livelihood increases so when you have a person from the masses he thinks about the masses so many of the dravidian leaders are from the masses so when they from the masses their thought process is to how to improve the livelihood of 2 to 3 crore people out of their poverty take the education intervention the various see this is a caste ridden program so social what is social justice here again it is a caste based program to undo the wrong doings right so all type of here it's been confused into a economic program or economic liberation program no when you have a caste hierarchy system be placed when service sector is been dominated by priestly classes or professional uh, courses are dominated by priestly classes we need to undo the program by a similar caste based intervention which is an affirmative action which is widely acknowledged especially in the michigan case in united states or in when in australia or any other parts of the world even in south africa where people go ahead to uh, ask for uh, affirmative action even in private uh, companies who are investing in south africa here we are in a very tamil nadu very it is in a very uh, utmost level people think it's based on population no it's not based on population we should understand the social justice program in tamil nadu is coupled with rationalism and regional tendencies where it is gives a privilege or it gives an access for an underprivileged section maybe a backward or most backward or inner reservation among the scheduled caste communities to understand to have an access to a professional education to become a doctor or to become engineer 
not as a proportional representation, but to understand the dignity, to understand the self-respect, to understand that he can match with any of the professionals in the world. He can match with any of the professionals in, in the previous subsequent years where he, his father or his grandfather have been denied access to any type of education to make him feel confident that he can come into the mainstream. That's why if you analyze the intangible impact, the doctor population ratio is equal to Finland in Tamil Nadu. One is 253. The public health system is very stronger. We have around 40, 000, around 17,000 doctors and 27,000 nurses working in government public health system because in order to deliver health to the rural and the underprivileged section of the society, Dravidian model took a concept of educating the underprivileged section and the rural people to become doctors and nurses to deal with the population. Now, center in Delhi are scratching their heads out to implement the rural health program. They're finding out ways. They're finding out collateral entries or uh, other type of uh, uh, paramedical courses or even uh, non-allopathic uh, doctors stream into the delivery of rural care. But in Tamil Nadu, the simple strategy is hit the rural health care, uplift the rural health care, just making workforce from the rural sections of the society. So the entire social justice program implemented by Dravidian parties in election were able to empower. So if you see the rural uh, uh, quota for affirmative action given in 96 and 2001 of Palangir period or inner reservation given to the uh, manual scavenging population of Tamil Nadu to become doctors in which their parents were working as uh, community health workers or sweepers, their sons have become deans and nephrologists and cardiologists in the same government medical colleges. Those type of narrations have got converted into reality because political uh, stream and the social justice stream with regional autonomy passed in line together. So where we face resistance, who struck down the rural quota, who uh, brought in the famous meritorious or merit-based exams, uh, especially to nullify the Tamil Nadu program, who struck down the 50% uh, rural uh, affirmative action provisions given for rural health doctors in postgraduate education, who struck down the super specialty courses given to government institution doctors in government medical colleges, or who struck down the entire public health structure. Uh, it, I would say the same are in model, I would recollect in the judicial system and the uh, Delhi centric bureaucratic. Uh, uh, policy makers, irrespective of the government of the center. So that's why regionalism comes to play. That's why federalism comes to play. Now we want to restore Dr. Ambedkar's constitution, what it said, health and education to be in the state list. The Kothari Commission 1978 very clearly said that health and education should be in the state list. Any attempts to move it from the state list will react to confusion and chaos. That's what's happening. We saw the center handling the pandemic now. Our, 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 our centralized uh, way of doing things have lead to chaos and confusion where it fails to respect the regional differences and regional uh, strengths and weaknesses of each and every uh, state where regional states have never uh, take part in any type of consultation process in initial initial vaccine policies or vaccine product procurement or ventilator procurement or essential drugs procurement. So, so Javidian political system has trying to give attempts repeatedly or trying to teach lessons to the center repeatedly. Come on, this, this Javidian way of system is a success model where you can try to emulate in other states. So now Mamta's uh, Banerjee of West Bengal is trying to do that. We have seen Andhra Pradesh is trying to do that. We have seen, even though Karnataka is holding by BJP government, the reservation system is quite stronger. Regional aspiration is quite stronger. So when you have a when you have an underprivileged section uh, project, the upliftment in the livelihood in sectors of education, health, and other intervention, so that increases the human capital. So that's why during 96 in 2001, when globalization project came into India, when the development project in the name of uh, reforms, I would say, they say reforms, you know, the globalization project came into India, 60 to 70 percent of entrepreneurships belonging to backward and scheduled class, scheduled class communities only in Tamil Nadu, then compared to the rest of the state. 
women entrepreneurs because kalagar in 1989 government gave property rights to women it was ambedkar's dream it was also an ambedkar's reason to resign from the nehru's cabinet it was done in tamil nadu in 89 and maximum number of women entrepreneurships are also from tamil nadu there are about 10 lakh to 6 lakh of msmes but what the demonetization and uh, gst did it closed down our many uh, 1 lakh companies were closed down because small entrepreneurships were not able to survive the onslaught so again it's from the center which are without without taking into consideration of the states see the draconian way of gst implementation we are assisting here from this part of the state so when you look at the entire picture of the trajectory when when we have a composite type of government at the center for example whether it's national front government in the 90s or united front government experiments or you would say even the nda one by led by atal bihari watchpai which has a consultative process representation of many states or the upa one you see the development module was much more inclusive acknowledging the states even a and a right wing force party was not able to implement this way of things as it's implementing now now we have a fair open minded nda2 with a majority in type of center with no much of participation of the any of the ministers i would say i would have i would see only the minister prime minister and the pm office i can't even remember of the various cabinets in the center the authoritative way of implementing things the authoritative way of uh, amendments uh, created in the parliament in various aspects the authoritative way of amending the constitution about the whims and whims without respecting the uh, nature or the tendency of the constitution where our forefathers have given some space for the center in times of emergency and famines where misuse is happening especially using those emergency provisions where state has been reduced in the form of a district module again revenue model here has to offer to the rest of the states of the country about regional aspiration about federalism and preserving cultural identity to resist any type of attempts which try to impose or try to neglect or which try to suppress each and regional entities it has a lessons to offer and we are evolving and we are evolving yes we evolve for the better good so we also understand that our socialistic agenda our social transformation agenda or our space working in cultural spheres it is not given much importance as we are in the political program so if you see if you if you find a critical analysis the the the, the strong uh, tenant or strong segment of dmk is their social cultural project and the political project if if the social cultural project it's going to be on the back seat this political project wouldn't run more effectively so we have to revamp the way of narration to the subsequent youth population in 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 educating them about the success stories in educating them what are the what are the mistakes and rectification measures and how to deliver to the younger generation so that we got an egalitarian way of living to offer so with that i'll uh, rest Thank my you. case yeah <laughs> that's that's great that's that's a great start i think um it sets out our agenda very well uh and and the kind of overview you've given uh in the context of what is happening now as well as the some of the latest measures that uh, you've also talked of you know we'll probably revisit the questions of affirmative action uh, more specifically when we talk of the shifts within political parties as well as an evaluation of the political economy and the kind of impacts um there's also lessons to be learned from whether um the onus is now going to be on dmk to mobilize the party and resist this kind of onslaught on federalism and social justice that you have talked of uh, in your paper as well you know since you are representing the party there's also that kind of party onus and party line that obviously has filtered through your presentation as well and it's nice to get that kind of historical background as well for those of us who are trying to understand the region in more granular detail from this uh, to, to get a glimpse of the history as well at the very grassroots that you talk of is from ambedkar and to actually 
make it a constitutional right that's, that comes out. We already have a few questions lined up. Um, I don't know if you want to take them now or we hear um, uh, Professor Vijay Bhaskar first, and maybe then we can stop um, after hearing you, um, because that will tie up with uh, further interpretation of the Dravidian model uh, that might come out from your latest book as well that, uh, that you want to talk of. And I think um, it'll, be, uh, it'll be good to move to you now and then perhaps put questions together. Thank you again. Um, Dr. Arilan, for all your insights, and I look forward to the answers later. There'll be questions on gender that has come up already. So that uh, I, I could I could possibly read some of the questions so that it gives you some time to think while the other uh, panelists will put forward. I think there there is a question about sexual and gender identities and how. Um, the Dravidian movement would evolve its ideology to guarantee its rights. A question from Yogesh G. Um, I would request uh, everyone to at least mention your affiliation when you put questions, which helps us to understand your own background and the kind of questions that uh, you're raising, uh, whether it relates to any, any kind of expertise as well. Uh, there's also another, so the same person's question is how you would then define secularism and relate to the social development with secularism or the lack of it, given that you yourself, um, uh, you're a religious person as well as a member of a secular party. So it's really the question is about how you define secularism and relate uh, the social development with secularism or the lack of it. I think it's an interesting question that then ties up with the uh, issues of religion more generally and how the British have played with religion um, <clears throat> in the formation of the nation. A large comment has come through along the same line about religion and administration of the subcontinent. So I, I just leave it to, uh, you know, th there's also questions about education, public health and the faculty of the Harriet Watt University uh, Sudhagar uh, Mutu, who has raised this question on um, the autonomy to safeguard education and public health sector. Uh, question again to you, Dr. Rilan. So if you think yeah. about these things and we come back to your answers after this, uh, that would be quite great. Um, Dr. Vijay Bhaskar, if we can get on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjukta. And uh, First, thanks to the Association Institute of SOAS for asking me to be on this uh, eminent panel. It's also good to see a lot of friends on this panel. Uh, and finally, yeah, thank you, Dr. Edelin, for <laughs> laying out the broad contours of what we mean by Dravidian model of development has been. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not going to elaborate on that at the moment. I'll, maybe I'll drop on it you know, in between as I kind of go along. Yeah, I mean, I I to introduce yours is more to do with the developmental challenges. Right. It is right. particularly Absolutely. about the post-election phase. Absolutely. So yeah. that ties up with yeah. uh, the theoretical model of development, I think. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so before I get on to the set of developmental challenges that the state faces moving forward, I would like to highlight uh, one aspect or the kind of importance of the need to move the frontier, you know, the terrain in which Dravidian politics is being kind of fought for, you know. I'll just kind of elaborate that in a moment. Uh, just before the uh, recent set of assembly elections, uh, I was speaking to a journalist who was based in Kerala, and at the point in time, uh, it looked like the BJP may uh, win Bengal, you know, so that was what uh, it was looking like. There's all these reports about, you know, that it was uh, making a lot of waves and so on. And this journalist friend, he said uh, that actually, I mean, B, when he mentioned B, he was assistant for Kerala and Tamil Nadu. He said that actually we are in a state of siege by this authoritarian, majoritarian wave uh, from the north. And he was saying that, you know, not many people in Kerala seem to be kind of sensing it. So when so when the TMC's victory, uh, you know, 
uh, gave us a huge amount of breathing space. There was no two ways about it. And not only did it do that, it also highlighted the need for collaborative federal relations you know, across state governments, not just to build a, a kind of a credible political alternative at the All India level, but even to secure some of the gains or some of the de visible developmental gains that individual states have made as a result of you know, state level progressive politics. You know, I think that is why it's important. Mm -hmm. But however, as Suhas Palshikar points out you know, in the piece in the post elections, he says, while many people think that TMC's victory offers a fulcrum around which a credible alternative to right-wing majoritarianism can be built, he says, he actually sounds a warning saying that a similar kind of anticipation was there when the uh, Mahagat Bandhan, you know, victory took place in Bihar in 2015 elections, and then subsequently, you know, completely things changed. So he says, if actually if one back to build a credible alternative, if in case if regional parties have to come together, it's very, very important to have clarity on why they actually oppose the BJP. And often you find across several states, you won't find that clarity on, on the ideological plank on which they have to kind of contest the BJP, yeah? And here is where the Dravidian movement's opposition comes in as very, very significant and important because it has a very credible ideological basis in which it can, you know, contest uh, uh, the kind of Hindu writing majoritarian politics, be it in terms of social justice or in, be it in terms of demand for greater autonomy. So, you know, but however, we also know that to establish, sustain this progressive politics, it has to kind of extend its frontiers. These kinds of principles have to kind of travel to other states, even to secure the kind of gains that the state has been has able to make, you know, through the limited mobilization. So two things here. So on the one hand, you know, uh, we need uh, uh, the emergence of regional assertions and regional politics and claims for uh, great alternative being made by other states. At the same time, it's important that other states imbibe some of the key elements of Dravidian politics if they actually were to come together to form a credible alternative. You know, I think that's the key point that you know, needs stressing you know, going forward. And the second important reason as to why the terrain has to kind of shift outside, you know, further away out of Tamil Nadu, is also uh, because Dravidian politics also offers a template for an I. Uh, uh, lower caste mobilization, which actually democratizes uh, you know, development much more than you know what is possible in other states, which have also experienced lower caste mobilization, particularly in the Hindi heartland. Uh, I mean, especially if you look at the recent work by Amit Ahuja, his point is that you know despite uh, lower caste mobilization in states like Bihar and UP, you don't find the kind of demo uh, the politics of recognition translating into politics of distribution to the extent it has happened in Tamil Nadu. Yeah. And one reason uh, which uh, people like Jaffer and others have pointed out is that often lower caste mobilization has essentially based, uh, been based on specific task lines, one. And two, often this mobilization has been based on valorizing of caste identities by uh, you know, uh, by appeals to some kind of a mythical glorious past with all this caste kind of experience in the past. Now, the danger with that is it fits in very well with this uh, Hindu writing idea of, you know, celebrating your caste, according your caste pride and so on. So it can easily dovetail into a right-wing Hindu nationalist kind of politics. And this is where, again, the kind of lower caste mobilization that derivative politics made possible uh, and which could enable or resist the incursions of Hindu majority politics, you know, offers lessons to build an alternative to the Hindu right wing thing. I think on both these counts, I think it's important that the terrain of derivative politics moves outside Tamil Nadu to other states. Uh, that is an important lesson that the recent elections actually kind of you know, brings forth. Now, uh, coming to what is happening in terms of development challenges within uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, one, uh, as we all know, as Dr. Hillen, uh was pointing out, an important plank or the key plank on which social justice was envisaged was about ensuring or you know democratizing access to education and access to employment in the modern sectors and in the modern spheres, yeah, through uh, affirmative action policies and so on. And Tamil Nadu has 
made considerable progress in that front. For example, if you look at the new education policy, uh, it kind of sets a target of transferring 50% of youth, of ensuring at least 50% of youth attend higher education by 2035. But if you look at the latest Aisha report uh, on higher education, you find that Tamil Nadu's more, more than 51% of Tamil Nadu's youth who have completed high school are already in some form of higher education or the other. Yeah, and this is also socially inclusive, be it in terms of caste and be it in terms of gender. Uh, so, you know, in terms of uh, broad basing, a huge uh, Tamil Nadu is way ahead of, you know, most states in the country. However, the challenge that is emerging, which is a next generation challenge, but it's a very, very critical challenge, is the unevenness in the kind of education that's going kind of uh, in access to education, primarily in terms of quality. It, the unevenness is uh, visible between children going to government schools and private schools, both aided and unaided, children going to schools in rural areas and urban areas and so on. The interesting thing is, though the learning outcomes in public schools are actually relatively better than in private schools, you find a greater privatization of education, both at the primary and the higher level over a period of time, uh, happening. And what happens is only a very, very small share of children attending government schools enter into professional education, be it engineering and medicine, because these are the routes to achieve you know, better quality jobs. In fact, yesterday, the current government has constituted a commission to look into reasons as to why it is so. But the issue is that a lot of institutions, apart from differences happening in school education, these are also getting amplified uh, due to differences in the quality of education being offered at the tertiary level as well. So though Tamil Nadu has the largest number of institutions within the top 100 in the National Institute of Ranking Framework, what we find is that most of these institutions are in bigger cities and in metropolitan locations. Often, uh, higher education institutions in small towns and colleges, uh, the standards are not adequate. So what happens is, if social justice is the primary, education is the key driver of social justice as the key ensure of social justice, these differences undermines, you know, the kind of uh, uh, the extent to which social justice can actually be achieved going forward. Now, what this also has happened in the domain of politics is, while these differences are driven by class, caste, and spatial locations, often uh, the inability to kind of acquire jobs, good quality jobs, despite access to higher education, you find them translating into some kind of resentment among. Uh, uh, middle caste youth, you know, into backward caste youth, uh, towards some of, some amount of limited mobility experienced by Dalit youth, which are more visible in the particular locality. You know, uh, so that kind of split. Because if you look at uh, look at the success of Dalit mobilization, uh, in terms of its ability to suture together, to put together a, a block of heterogeneous lower caste then this kind of resentment clearly undermines the ability of the block to kind of sustain itself in the longer run going forward. And a similar kind of a divide, an opportunity to divide in the domain of education employment is the knowledge of English language. Uh, in a globalizing world and in a world where most of the high-end jobs are in the high-end services sector, knowledge of soft skills, particularly spoken English, has become a key uh, 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 window you know, the key uh, uh, door for, you know, new opportunities in the uh, labor market. And clearly that's again, you know, denied to last sections of youth who are kind of access to education. education. Uh, this translates into, again, you find this is again, this opportunity divide is clearly visible in terms of lower caste versus upper uh, uh, elites. And also within lower caste, you find the huge difference between uh, youth in big cities as opposed to smaller towns in rural areas. This is a new access of divide which is again kind of, kind of tends to kind of undermine the block that you know we uh, I mentioned just earlier, and this inability to kind of negotiate this English speaking world of opportunities uh, uh, translated into some kind of uh, an investment, you know, some kind of a desire for a nostalgic Tamil past. Yeah, you find that kind of happening, uh, and interestingly, this nostalgia for a Tamil past is not tied to this anti-caste uh, politics that always, that Dravidian politics always invested this Tamil identity with. Rather, it's about uh, some kind of revival of uh, tradition 
uh, where uh, you know in, there is a kind of a valorization of again caste based occupations and so on and that is best represented by the success the relative success of the nam tam nakati which uh, the vote share increased up to 6% from over less than 2% in 2016 elections so this nam tam nakati you know essentially foregrounds this idea of tamilness which is in some sense a very ethnicized tamil identity uh, through caste lineage and so on and often attributes the slippages uh, in development that we see uh because of dravidian rule and which it says it is ruled by non tamils essentially non tamil speaking uh things uh by you know uh, members of this political parties so it you know it mobilizes around a strong appeal to uh, return to tamil native traditions and so on which can again once again easily feed into a tamil hindu identity and also politics of uh, right wing mobilization which upholds caste hierarchy but within a tamil uh, idiom you know so it opens up that danger as well you know which is something going forward the politics has to kind of encounter mm. uh the third uh, point i mean how much more time do i have can i take a couple of minutes more yeah is it okay so okay, yeah. yeah uh the third point that i'd like to highlight is the issues emerging from the logic of modernization itself mm. uh as dr irinan pointed out the key uh, route to ensure social justice within dravidian ethos is to ensure inclusive broad based modernization you know ensure opportunities in this modern sector to uh, people from lower caste now increasingly it's becoming uh, evident globally that the ability of people to move out of agriculture into modern sectors be it manufacturing and services despite investments in education is not easily available to everybody in the sense that there are not enough employment opportunities despite the modern sectors expanding tamil nadu itself is a classic example we have been able to move people out of agriculture much more than most major states in the country and we also able to give them the education and tamil nadu also is a state which has the highest share of employment outside agriculture you know both in manufacturing and in service sector despite that you find a high degree of uh unemployment underemployment among educated you yeah and this is not unique to tamil nadu you find this happening in most parts of global south and you also find that happening even in the advanced uh, uh even in the global north as well so this ability of modernization to actually deliver a development through generating good quality employment is increasingly being called into question uh you know across the world and again going forward while certain things can definitely be kind of addressed extent to which it can completely deliver the kind of you know uh, the promise of inclusive modernization is something you know is is going to be a big challenge of course you do have access to a global labor market and so on but in the last few years we know that even that is being kind of uh, closed for various reasons you know across because of rise of nationalism across several countries and so on uh my last point is about uh, is uh, ties up a lot with what uh, dr edilan uh, pointed out which is about the erosion of subnational autonomy in the domain of policy making new education policy is clearly uh, one and again uh, the introduction of uh, gst completely uh, erodes the ability of states to actually resource to raise taxes and often what you find when you look at central transfers often these transfers are tied to specific programs and you know or always comes to certain kinds of conditions and often these conditions are not in the best interests of uh, the states yeah that's another challenge and which, which it looks like it's only going to get worse in the year, uh, years to come if not months that is something that we need to kind of watch out for and another important domain is the changes to labor laws which have been initiated at the all india level with this new labor uh, code bill now tamil nadu is a state which has been able to sustain relatively higher wages in manufacturing and in both rural and urban areas across all sectors and this labor laws and and a great, relatively great degree of social protection as well and this new labor laws the ability to kind of sustain these gains and improve these gains again you know uh, are being kind of called into question and again the farmers protests on this marketing loss for agriculture products these are various kinds of areas you know where uh, this challenges kind of remain and finally uh, again which is partly linked to the logic of modernization is the relationship between social justice and ecological justice 
uh, when you premise social justice primarily through inclusive modernization, the extent to which the challenges uh, posed by uh, people who are kind of claiming for ecological justice uh, can be kind of addressed is going to be the another major uh, domain, you know, where we need to think hard in terms of policy making and also articulating a different kind of a development imaginary where both these things can go together. Yeah. So with this session stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vijay Bhaskar, to bring out, uh, you know, very key points about, as you say, the development challenges, uh, particularly post-election, and also touching on uh, some new legislations on labor, as well as the current climate crisis, uh, which will obviously generate uh, questions about how we integrate social justice with ecological justice. And these are the kind of things that are going to be really the big challenges post-COVID reconstruction, I would say, um, that will play on the minds of the ordinary people. But I think from your presentation, um, you know, the question of inequity kind of looms large. And it seems to me that it's almost ironical that, uh, you know, inequity questions are stemming from a policy that aimed for broad access. So, you know, on the one hand, you're trying to <clears throat> incorporate policies that are kind of over it all encompassing and is meant for a broader access to people. But at the same time, it is generating all kinds of inequalities that um, are not necessarily about the projected aim of these policies, but how infrastructural developments or how investments have followed or how people have been able to access um, these, these changes. So it, it's, it's a long-term thing that's obviously brought up. It's not something that is short-term that is generating this kind of grievance among caste groups. And therefore the question of inequality kind of pervades within caste, whereas caste itself is a marker of inequality. So this is this kind of a double dynamics that is playing in Tamil Nadu's politics is quite interesting to bring out, you know, whether the Dravidian model of development is able to therefore cope with these kind of new challenges uh, opens up um, some further debates, I think, uh, on the overall aim of access and the inherent nature of some kind of inequities that we are seeing. So um, I think, um, say, having said that, there's a particular question from uh, K. Gopinathan, which is to bring, bring us back to the point on education. And it says that same, how to, how to bring equal educational syllabus to all students studying within Tamil Nadu. Same like caste-based system, now quality education is slowly becoming accessible only to category of people with developed socioeconomic background. So the same kind of thing that you were saying that it is, it is accessible to certain, you know, some kind of socioeconomic background, even within, within caste categories, perhaps. Um, there's also, um, there's also a question from Yogesh again about uh, professor brings up really important point, but less often discussed. That is about the rise of micro right Tamil nationalist parties that mostly peddle on exclusionism, xenophobia, and puritanism, bordering on supremacist attitudes. And what tools, if any, does the Dravidian movement have to deal with this? So really, is this a question that's more ideological or it is more a question that we can pin it to the development model itself? So I think that the contradictions need to, to be addressed here as well. Um, We'll, we'll stop here and I, I can read the questions again if you would like to take those now, Erilyn, and, and have any comments yeah. to make at this point. Also, yeah, Prabhu, Prabhu Rajendran, you're waiting very, very patiently there for your observer comments. If you would like to say anything at this stage, then I would invite you. I think there's already we've rolled on quite rich points and lots of discussions around, you know, the models of development. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I just wanted to say, like, I mean, I'm actually, I mean, like, I have my identity as a Tamil, Tamilian from Tamil Nadu. And now I'm in a situation like where I'm proud to call myself as a non-resident Tamilian. 
previously mm-hmm. i used to like say a non resident indian from tamil nadu with the current government coming into a position like i mean like now i have got the unique identity which i'm really proud to call myself as i mainly wanted to join in as another fellow tamilian sitting outside tamil nadu to know about like what i mean like i when i mean like when i was first introduced to politics possibly in my teens that's where like all it was like mostly around the dravidian parties and that is all i knew so i would have wanted to call myself as like i had a special interest in dravidian politics but i didn't like have the ideologies to go into detail and having listened to dr elilan and professor vijay baskar i have kind of like now got a better understanding of the dravidian models and also like i mean i'm looking forward to see the future works from professor vijay baskar about the challenges what are in front of us i'm really like i mean like really looking forward to it thanks a lot dr gosh thank you um and dr elen would you like to answer anything any questions yeah the first question is uh, we are accommodating itself as a religious person in our secular party of dmk so you should know the mm-hmm. understanding roots of dmk it's offshoot from dravida kalagam which is a nationalist association and i myself a periodist is based on rationalist principles or i would say of an atheist but you should understand the secularism understanding by the indian supreme courts and the secularism understanding by people of tamil nadu uniquely different the indian supreme court conveniently conveniently redefines secularism as an inclusion of all religions but in tamil nadu it has always been a private affair uh, if you take my election plan when i participated in elections so few of my uh, hindu to our friends uh then back to my old videos where i do lecture classes for my cadres on scientific tempers rationalisms and also to make them explain the various scriptures which was responsible for demanding them and which is responsible for the superstitious beliefs so they were edited and they were uh, uh, doctored and it was widely circulated among the uh, twitters and facebook pages but it was a uh gift for me during the election plank because those type of rationalist ideas were very well very much imbibed within the tamil society they have to understand that i am a non partisan person or a non religious biased person so true secularism worked out well in my thousand lights constituency and i would like to congratulate in my fellow hindutva brothers for making a huge victory for me by their circulating my videos and that is tamil nadu lessons to offer when i walked into each and every household in tamil nadu especially in chennai in thousand lights constituency for them pongal is the same for all religions ramzan is same for all religions and jesus christmas is also same for all religions each one celebrates each one religion they all find an occasion to join together and uh, it's completely a, a a private affair completely private affair uh, regarding religion it's a personal belief system they never confuse uh, religion into a political sphere as they do very well in the north but i was saying the certain then uh, we have to really draw lines because the observation made by professor vijay bas especially in rural uh, districts or especially western districts of tamil nadu where uh, new two elements are working on caste lines to making a caste structure identity submitting uh, with religious identity to break down this uh, success stories i think we have to again uh, push again the uh, broad based uh, view of scientific temper education in all aspects because uh, when uh, periyar took the path of social atheism where he wanted to eradicate caste where he found caste root was religion when the root of religion he found it by the presence of god or god belief system to reason he went to the foci just like a surgeon removing the tumor of first right instead of giving a paracetamol tablet but here on we have an educated mass where we can very well explain uh, the scientific basis of human life evolution about origins of the world origins of the universe to the younger generation to the children and science should be taught with scientific temper and that very well goes with uh, vijay baskar sir's uh, narration of improving the school syllabus yes school syllabus should be in a form especially science subject especially in all uh, under privileged sections as well as government schools or or government funded schools where science have to be taught with scientific temper so those type of narration will help us for a better uh, generation with human human ethos and secularitarian equilibrium values 
So regarding Tamil Nadu, because DMK, as you know, it's, it's a party of Saivites, Vaishnavites, local deities, Christians, Muslims, as well as it's also a place for atheists like me also. So it's an inclusive party by its own. So the, the personal belief system is immaterial. The availability of candidate determines how far he is able to handle the party hierarchy system and how far he is able to campaign effectively to win an election. So that narration will be there. It will. It is bound to be there. So that answers my first question. The second question about the LGBT community is you should understand DMK's party, which has an option of uh, evolving itself. Uh, in 2006, election manifesto of DMK, it was, it was the first government to, to introduce a work board for transgenders. And it was during the DMK regime in 2006, they opened up uh, voluntary sex correction surgeries in government general hospitals. And you know, Tirchi Shiva, the DMK Rajya Sabha MP, the single member uh, motion for uh, transgender rights to you identify themselves as a separate gender identity is also from DMK. And I would congratulate my present chief minister, DMK leader, Mr. MK Stalin, who nominated uh, a, a transgender uh, Bharatanatyam classical dancer into the uh, Developmental Council, where Vijayabhas is also a part of a member of the council, which is equal to Nidhi of the center, to take part in the planning process of the state. So, so the empowerment, we also have a elected uh, councillor belonging to the transgender community to participate also. So regarding LGBT rights and individual rights, yes, it's, it's a long way to go. And DMK found its way to evolve, especially any type of oppression may be, whether in the form of class or caste or gender, DMK has always been on the uh, oppressed side and uh, to fight for the uh, oppressed side. That answers the second question. Any other question? Um, that, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you don't have to categorically answer uh, all the questions individually. You can sort of club together some of the ideas in those questions and if there are overlaps, then we can, that's it. you know, no, that's it. Two extract. Questions over that. Yeah, also extract from your answer some of the broader things that you've said. Um, there is one question that I would like to raise at this point before we move on to political parties and mobilization issues. Um, that is, you know, the Dravidian movement. This is another question from Sujan Vijayaraj, um, a STEM student, I think. Um, and, and the question relates to the racial connotation given to the term Dravidian. And given that the Dravidian movement is visibly progressive in many spheres, how do Dravidian ideologues address this attitude despite it being scientifically discredited? Now with that, I want to also um, you know, raise this whole point about, uh, I think Professor Vijay Bhaskar, you did mention the, this, this tendency for uh, you know, this kind of a Sanskritized way of actually, you know, uh, relating to how caste identities are being manipulated, you know, whether this is kind of a populist mobilization that is going on uh, with respect to religious, religion and religious identity, especially, you know, how the BJP manages to win seats uh, in this election and, and how it's used religion, therefore, to to gain that advantage, whereas the Dravidian movement is extremely scientifically rooted. Is this whole racial thing underpinning of this at all feeding into this kind of popular mobilization? Maybe those two points can be you know, clubbed together and, and answered. Um, if, you, if you want to say yeah, anything yeah. on that. Can I? Yeah, if you want yeah. to say anything yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this idea of this Dravidian identity uh, being a racialized one, uh, it has, I mean, many people, I mean, uh, have actually shown it's quite not the case. Uh, in fact, I mean, uh, a, a famous quote, uh, which people cite from Korea to discredit that kind of a reading, uh, is something like where Korea says that anybody anywhere in the world who feels oppressed be it a marginalized tribe in Japan or a, a community in, a, a, in the Arab world, mm -hmm. anybody can 
be a part of uh, uh, you know this idea of uh, this being a dravidian anybody anybody in the world who suppressed is actually a dravidian it's in a very very broad uh, reflexive sense you know uh, in which he uses uh, the term dravidian and if you look at the kind of politics that the dravidian the dmk and the other dravidian all dravidian parties are kind of professed you can see that very clearly nowhere you know uh, i mean i would be very hard put to say that you know that they use this idea of a racialized uh, identity uh, to uh, you know to talk about uh, dravidian uh, sense of you know social justice and so on and in fact uh, if you look at some of the moves uh, taken in the past uh, to address uh, inequalities not all of them have been uh, primarily through caste based affirmative action you know there are moves to introduce reservation for students who belong to a uh, first generation students you know who are the first uh, students in their households to enter into college or uh, there is there was also a move to kind of offer affirmative action a separate quota for students who go to government schools in rural areas of course all these things as dr ilan pointed out earlier were shot down by uh, the judiciary so this idea of social justice is a very very reflexive one you know which continues to kind of you know uh, respond to kind of you know changes that are taking place in the larger thing so to kind of see that as racialized and essential identity uh, you know would be hard to that be hard claim to make you know go by going what has kind of happened so far and that is why even this idea of this micro right this common nationalism it is said it is kind of problematic for similar reasons yeah again you are kind of investing it with a certain degree of essentialness the saying you need to be a tamil speaking uh, caste you know because obviously all of us speak tamil but uh, you know uh, they also have the sense of you know certain castes are tamil and some castes are not uh so that division is uh, hugely problematic and that is one reason why uh, uh, you know this uh, this uh, emergence of nationalist right wing tamil nationalism uh, can be problematic uh, uh and then to the first question that you kind of asked about this kind of inequality the inequities that are kind of emerging uh i think it's important to keep in mind that this is a work in progress I mean, yeah i mean and then when you say work in progress it's not even that you know you start from point a and then have a very clear vision of where you reach point b because even in this process of moving from point a to point b there are whole kinds of things that are happening simultaneously not only not only within the state but also at the pan indian level and also at the global level you know be it in terms of you know uh, what how we imagine development what uh, kind of in macro policies are kind of there and so on so it is a very reflexive uh, process but the key thing is like for instance if you look at the manifesto uh, of the dmk of the selections you find some of these issues are uh, the promises of some of these issues being addressed for example learning outcomes mm-hmm. looms large and so does this issue of employment among educated youth uh so you know so that is uh, this what shall i say it's a processual kind of a movement uh which responds to kind of any changes that are taking place i think that's the best way to kind of understand this uh, uh, thing so to that extent when you use the term model i mean you know it's essentially it's actually it's uh, meant to kind of indicate uh how you know how how is basically it's uh, method of explanation of the social change that has taken place in tamil nadu social and political change and economic change taken place in tamil nadu in the last 50 years yeah and it's a model to the extent that uh, it also shows how lower caste globalization can actually generate a little more inclusive development it's only in that sense it's not the uh, closed kind of a system it's not in sure. that sense that anyone can kind of understand yeah. okay yeah I'll, i'll try to Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, very briefly. Yeah. Few, few, few. Very briefly regarding that uh, racial narrative. Mm. This is this. These narratives are especially on critics of Dravidian. You should, you should, you should see the Dravidian as an umbrella word rather than a racial word. Umbrella word which protects extremes of temperature about a composite number of underprivileged sections. Then, if you say Dravidian as racial, you should say Scottish also as racial, <laughs> which we are later. Yeah. Um. I think uh, you know. Um. Uh, uh, Dr. Naganathan, while you're here, I want to to bring um, a Dr. Uh, Jill Vernier, if you're if you're with us. Um, could you could you then sort of you know maybe now talk about the recomposition of the elites in the DMK, which is something that would then tie up nicely with the discussions we've had so far. So that 
Uh, yeah, you're, you're going to screen share. Thanks. So if we start on that, and then we'll revisit some questions again. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's 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 quite intimidating to be uh, in the presence of you know, real Tamil Nadu expert when uh, I'm, I'm merely an external observer. To make matter worse, uh, based in Delhi, uh, but uh, <laughs> I had a research center um, where where we collect um, data on yeah. state politics, and we recently covered obviously the Tamil Nadu election, and so I'm going to show you some of the results of that um, effort. So, a key question in Indian electoral politics, and this is something that we've already started discussing in, in this panel, is the question of inclusion and political inclusion across the political spectrum within all major political parties. Uh, no party in India can afford not to claim to be inclusive, to provide representation, and therefore a measure of power sharing to a large array of groups. And Tamil Nadu and Dravidian politics are an interesting case to consider as they have adopted early a model of politics with inclusion as a premise, not just as a long-term objective, but as a base and a grammar for political action. Uh, and that contrast with the more outwardly elitist trajectory adopted by other states, particularly in the Hindi belt. So the question I want to ask really is, what does the concept of political elite means then in, in a model that calls itself inclusive? And is there empirical evidence that we can use to uh, question uh, and perhaps even show the limitations of uh, that claim of, of um, inclusion? And so I'm going to use data that you know, was collected recently. Uh, this data and the presentation is a result of the work of several people, including Vignesh Kartik Rajamani, who's a doctoral student at King's College, uh, Pulari Baskar, who's a political science student at Ashoka, several of my colleagues uh, at, at TCPD. So I'll start with a few observations on representational patterns in Tamil Nadu Assembly. I will then compare the profile of the DMK and ADMK MLAs uh, over the past five elections. And then I will look at the geography of uh, caste in particular, which will illustrate the relative stability of caste representational patterns in, in Tamil Nadu. And then if time allows, I'll, I'll, I'll look at incumbency data, uh, data from uh, that we coded on the political career trajectories of uh, Tamil Nadu MLAs uh, as a way to assess the degree of turnover, renewal of political elite, but also as a measure of, of uh, centralization of power within party um, apparatus. Uh, all the data used, by the way, except for the caste data, which is still under review, is openly accessible, right? So everyone knows here that the Tamil Nadu Assembly has been dominated by a variety of OBC groups ever since Dravidian parties uh, have started winning elections. Um, the overall share of OBC representation in Tamil Nadu hasn't changed much in 50 years. Uh, it's an average, it's 72% of all the seats. Uh, there's a marginal decrease over a long period of time from you know, 80% to, well, to 70% as a few non-OBC groups like the Naidus gained a little bit of representation, mostly in cities. But otherwise, OBCs in Tamil Nadu have enjoyed a proportionate representation in the assembly. They roughly make 76% of the total uh, population. So obviously, one needs to break down this category of OBC, which we do here in, in this chart. And what we have done um, is club a variety of individual caste or jatis into relevant uh, broader sociological and political categories like pevas, gundas, mudliyas, vanyas, um, etc. So uh, the gunda category, for example, for instance, includes groups like uh, the Kongu Velala Gondas, the Natu Gondas, the Ulali Gondas. Uh, the same goes for groups such as Tevas and, 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 and Vanya. So for those not familiar, these groups are agglomerates of various castes and subcastes. But for the sake of clarity, and because one can argue that these broader caste categories have a social and political meaning of their own, uh, we club them into these entities. And so that helps us see a few distinctive trends in terms of OBC groups representation within the Tamil Nadu uh, Assembly. You see, for instance, that uh, from 1971 to 2006, the Vanias held the lion's share of seats in the Tamil Nadu Assembly, but they started declining in the 90s. 
Devas took the lead in 2011. Uh, at the time, more than one OBC MLA out of four belong to that category. Uh, they have been uh, in a long-term uh, process of uh, political empowerment through, uh, through time via political representation uh, until 2016, where their representation dropped uh, when uh, the ADMK won a, a consecutive mandate. Uh, among the scheduled castes, which, which are not represented here, uh, Parayas are by far the most represented across parties. In 2016 and 2021, they made nearly 70% of all DMK and ADMK SC candidates and about 60% of all their MLAs. And the rest of SC representation uh, within both parties is split between Devendra Kula Valala, 13%, Palas Arun Tatias, 13 and 8%. So what I find to be common between those dominant groups is that they find representation across uh, major parties. And that's something that we observe in uh, other states uh, of India as well. The key to long-term caste empowerment and the key to long-term caste representation is to find representation across major party rather than align behind a specific uh, party. So one of the basis of the claim of inclusion is that at least the two major Dravidian party cater to similar groups, right? So um, there is also a residual category of other OBCs that is a collection of smaller groups that are not connected to one another sociologically, but they rose politically uh, until 2011. So what we see broadly is that the backward or the OBC political landscape in Tamil Nadu is dominated by three major groups, Vanyas, Devas, Gondas, and that over the past 20 years or so, there's been some change in the balance of power between these groups, partly linked to party performance, but for other factors, for other reasons uh, as well. So it could be linked to the swing character of elections in the state, uh, the representational fate of various groups could be tied to the electoral felicity of the two major Dravidian parties. But actually, as I've said before, these groups tend to be dominant because they are represented across parties. So it doesn't really matter if the DMK or the ADMK win, those castes will still be ahead, they will remain ahead. And, and, and I'll provide a little bit more detail about that. Uh, and we'll see also that the geography of castes uh, remains pretty stable uh, over time. So. We know that one of the basic tenets of Dravidian politics is its inclusive character. Both the DMK and the ADMK claim, and not without reasons, that they provide representations to a broad array of groups historically united in their opposition to traditional upper caste elites. So this uh, colorful chart uh, indicates that indeed, uh, both party and here we see the DMK have ground to claim to being inclusive, right? Uh, even if you can see a few groups, you know, uh, standing, uh, standing out. Uh, within the DMK, for instance, Vanyas, Tevas, and Gondas have a larger presence. They make nearly half of all the DMK MLAs in 2021. Uh, but what this chart shows you is that over five elections, regardless whether the DMK win or loses elections, uh, it retains actually its inclusive character. Right, so it's not a situation where uh, the party retract on the core base, that's more of the North Indian model. No, it retains that inclusive character, even if it loses an election badly, as it happened, say, uh, in, in, in 2000. Um, uh, in 2000. Um, the ADMK charts look similar. There's a few differences. Uh, over time, uh, overall, sorry, the ADMK uh, caters to a larger and larger array of dominant group, a larger array actually than the DMK. It tends also to win more uh, reserved uh, seats. There's a greater Dalit representation within the uh, ADMK uh, compared to the DMK. Uh, but still, 40%, around 40% of their MLAs come from the same three groups, Devas, Vanyas, Gondas, right? And many other groups get representation, but you could argue that they get nominal representations, a few seats. Right? So you, you do have, even if you have inclusion and diversity, you still have a disbalance of power uh, within uh, the, the, the political um, class. That picture, of course, is incomplete. Uh, we know that both parties add to their representation inclusiveness by roping in coalition or alliance partners. 
many of those parties are uh, caste-based formations uh, to a certain extent, but not entirely. Diversity is also partly outsourced to junior alliance partners. The DMK tends to do that more in reserved seats. It tends to distribute or allocate reserved seats to coalition partners more so than the ADMK, which partly explains why uh, it actually has fewer uh, SC MLAs uh, from, from, from those uh, seats. So as a result and in appearance, uh, it, no one, there's not one group in particular that seems to be dominating, right? Even though a small number of groups get a fair, a solid share of representation within both parties, it sort of oscillates between 40 to 50%, right? Uh, so that's MLA data, uh, by the way. We also have nomination data for the candidates. I'm not showing it here for time, but also because it basically tells us exact same thing. It literally does not look uh, particularly uh, different, right? And so if you look over, a, if you club, you know, MLAs elected over a period of 20 years, you see that these figures, you know, basically hold. Uh, since 2001, 372 individuals have been elected on the MK tickets. 50 of them were Vanias, 41 were Tevas, 30, 33 were Vedalas, 28 were Gondas, um, and, and, and so forth. We see that uh, the DMK also provides a, a fair representation to Naidus in intermediary caste, uh, to uh, Dalits in a much lesser extent, and within those Dalits, most of them are uh, Balayas. Uh, over five elections, only 14 Muslims have been elected on DMK tickets and only seven upper caste uh, MLAs have been elected. And the rest of the DMK's MLAs, 109 of them, are basically distributed across a wide range of uh, smaller uh, OBC uh, groups. If you look at the ADMK, on the other hand, uh, it won more elections, so it has uh, won more, uh, more, more seats. Uh, the larger groups tend to be uh, similar, except that the largest group represented are the Dalits, uh, followed by the Tevas, Gondas, Vanias, and so forth, right? Uh, just like in the DMK, most of the ADMK's SCMLAs are uh, Barrier. Another difference between the two parties is that over time, the share of dominant group representation slightly increases. It's not very obvious, it's not a very nice looking chart, but it, it does sort of tell you that over time, certain group actually are ascending, other groups are you know, uh, declining, and those the group that are ascending within the ADMK tend to be from those dominant uh, backward group uh, among the uh, OBCs. And uh, the DMK chart is much more blurry, but which shows that um, things are actually uh, uh, things are things actually more blurry within the DMK. We don't have a clear trend that particular type of groups actually are getting more representation over time. Uh, it's actually quite quite dynamic, right? So that's one part of the story. That's that's basically what emerges from uh, party uh, nomination practices. Right? If you want to make more sense of it, you need to also consider geography. So what I've done here is plot the cast of the MLA on a map. It basically shows you where uh, that OBC is dominated across the four, across sub-regions in, in the states and how various groups tend to be present on the map in, in clusters, right? You can spot uh, colored clusters, you know, on, on the map. So it may not come out very clear, clearly on the, on the screen, but uh, Vanias dominate in the Salem Dharmapuri district, as well as in the Tanjavur, Tiruvarur, and Nagapatnam districts. Uh, Gounders are clustered in the western region, in and around the Erod, Kombato, Krishnagiri, Tirupo district, and the Nilgiris. Tevas are more present across the central southern regions in Tanjavur district, around Madurai, Bindigul, Virudunagar, Tirumelveli districts, and Mudaliyas are concentrated in the northern region, which includes Chennai. So that's in, actually, it may sound you know, tedious and you may wonder you know, why is he you know, enumerating this, but you know, it's important because it tells you that caste competition at the constituency level is more likely to be intra-caste than inter-caste or between caste, right? All those major groups that I mentioned earlier tend to have geographical strongholds where parties tend to nominate candidates from similar background, right? Uh, and the result of that is that the geography of caste is quite stable. So this is 2021. 
and this is 2016. So it's not quite exactly the same map. You can actually spot quite a few differences, uh, but you can see that the geographical concentration of those clusters remain you know, somewhat uh, similar. And if you go back in time, the map actually would look uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, similar um, as well. And so that also tells us that uh, the diversity that we find in electoral politics does not only come from the inclusive mindset of political parties, but also from the social demographic and, and the reality that certain groups actually dominate subregions, localities, districts, um, and, and, and are so, uh, so, so, so powerful locally that they necessarily get co-opted by different political parties. Right? So the sources of inclusion may not just be an inclusive mindset, but it can also stem from uh, hard reality entrenched into, uh, into geography. Um, right? um, the inclusive model of Dravidian politics, by the way, does not extend to uh, women. Uh, this would make a different uh, presentation topic altogether. So I'll very quickly just say that both parties record in terms of women domination and representation is quite poor. That between the two of them, the DMK actually has a far worse record than the ADMK. As you can see here in 1991, Jalalita's rise to power saw the largest number of women elected in the Tamil Nadu Assembly, 32, 27 alone from the ADMK. And that women representation within the ADMK sort of declined uh, subsequently. Uh, but the, uh, the DMK never really um, caught up. If you look at the 2021 elections, women made only 6% or 5.6% of the DMK Alliance candidates, only 4.4% of their MLAs. The ADMK did better, but quite frankly, not much uh, better. So now what I have done so far is kind of a, a cast head counting exercise. And that may seem you know, a little bit abstract. Uh, descriptive representation is important, but individuals, of course, matter uh, as well. And so there is a trend in India across political parties towards centralization of decision-making processes, a hollowing of party apparatus to the benefit of the servicing of strong leader figures who use their prerogatives to entrench their control over party organizations. And there are two measures that we can use to assess the degree of centralization of control within parties, ticket distribution practices, and individual incumbency or the ability of MLAs to secure the re-election by getting a ticket to rerun in, in, in the first place. And so we have coded individual incumbency um, at uh, TCPD. And what it shows for Tamil Nadu here is that over time, only a small number of MLAs get to rerun to uh, get a consecutive um, term. That's the blue column. That's the ratio of rerunning incumbents. That basically tells you that with two exceptions since 1991, uh, a majority of MLAs don't even get to uh, rerun uh, or don't even get a chance to win a consecutive um, term. And in orange, it's uh, basically the strike rate of the uh, rerunning incumbents. So uh, uh, in 2021, less than half of uh, MLA sitting MLAs contested and slightly more than half of them actually won their seat. So technically speaking, it basically tells you that if you were elected in 2016, uh, you had more or less 25% chance of getting reelected uh, in 2021, right? And so as a result, most MLAs in the Tamil Nadu Assembly are first time MLAs. You see it's a huge number and, and, and you can see, uh, so the, 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 the Y axis is the number of terms served by, by MLAs, right? So one gentleman served 10 times, another gentleman served nine times, two gentlemen uh, served uh, seven times. And I'm saying gentlemen because they are all men. Right? Among all those uh, actually 46 MLAs in the current assembly who have served more than three terms, there are only two, uh, there are only two um, women. Right? So that leads me to another measure of power concentration. That's what I call the stable political class. Anyone elected three times or more 
in a given assembly is a professional politician, someone who can actually beat party in the incumbency, which we know is quite strong in, in Tamil Nadu politics. And so what you see in this chart is that the number of MLAs who are serving for the third time or more is actually very small, it's 46 people. Most of them are in the DMK, 29 of them, 11 of them are in uh, the ADMK. The figure in the square are the number of terms that they have served, right? Uh, and if you cross that data with the cast data that I showed before, you will see that the dominant group that tends to be more represented or largely represented in the assembly are even more overrepresented within that category of professional lasting politicians. Those who have close connections with party leadership, those who hold important position within the party apparatus, those who hold sway over their constituency for a variety of uh, for a, a variety of uh, reasons. And so if you look at uh, the data over the past uh, 20 years, uh, we see that MLAs from the Tevas, Banyas, Gondras uh, communities are more likely to make longer political careers while the others are more likely to basically be ejected after one term, either by their own party and if they get a chance to uh, rerun and or in many cases by uh, voters uh, themselves, right? And so uh, that also shows the benefit of having more individual from your group within your, port within your party. You can build a faction, you can you know, use you know, uh, inf cast influence uh, to secure your position, but that's something that uh, Andrew Wyatt would be far more competent than me to uh, talk about. And um, this is something similar. Uh, this is basically data that shows you that, you know, this is the number of 2016 MLAs and how many of them actually rerun. What it shows you is that uh, MLAs who belong to dominant OEC groups are far more likely to rerun than uh, SC MLAs, right? If you look actually here in the DMK, uh, there are no ACs among those who won more than three times, right? They, this is where the rotation really, uh, really takes place, right? So to conclude, a couple of observations. Uh, you know, what does this tell us about Dravidian politics? Two things, essentially. One, the Dravidian register does not bypass caste fully. You know, despite the uh, discourse on uh, inclusion, despite the discourse on you know backward caste or caste solidarity uh, uh, inherited you know from the past, uh, caste remains a salient uh, feature of electoral politics. It reposes on the stability of patterns of local dominance. It also reposes on the political relegation of non-dominant groups. There, there are limitations. That's the reason why you have such a proliferation of small caste-based parties. It's precisely because there's a number of groups who cannot find a place or a space within Dravidian parties. Again, this is something Andrew Wyatt has written uh, extensively about. And two, the resilience of caste is sustained by a number of factors, including the fact that those dominant OBC groups don't really have to compete too fiercely against one another because they contest in different parts of the state, in different regions and subregions, right? That of course fosters backward unity. It doesn't means that members from those groups don't have to, you know, pit against one another, um, and and that also helps to build this sort of surface of um, surface of um, unity. In other words, and 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 then. Third or last observation, there are important limits to inclusion of Dravidian politics. There's a large number of groups that do not get included and women in particular uh, don't seem to get included uh, in, in either uh, Dravidian parties. So in other words, Dravidian parties can practice caste politics, but without having to talk about it. They can still use general registers of mobilizations, uh, welfare, social policy, regional identity, the North, uh, to mobilize voters while anchoring their electoral strategy 
candidate selection and so forth uh, in, uh, according to local caste um, calculations. But because the landscape is extremely diverse uh, and because the strategy is localized. Hello. Yeah. Actually, I was I held up in a small meeting. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm done literally in 10 seconds. <laughs> so I think Arilan probably wants to respond to something that you've raised. That's yes. okay. Finish uh, and then I'm actually I'm actually I'm actually done, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can stop here actually. Yeah, I think I think more or less you've concluded uh, the main points um, about um, you know, but but one thing that I noticed from the presentation is that the DMK yeah. has got the OB category of the DMK was what fourteen percent, and that was that was quite high, I thought, in comparison to the AI DMK. So I just wondered whether. What, what, how would you, Erlen, talk about the OBC mobilization within the DMK at this moment? And so actually, actually, you understand about... uh, actually in coming to uh, ideologic politics and electoral politics, each yeah. political party has to find an equal uh, representation depending mm -hmm. upon the numbers, especially in, mm -hmm. to win an Indian democratic election. So that has forced each oh. political party to take a stand to have a representation an assimilation of uh, communities from uh, uh, understanding the Tamil Nadu uh, OBC and AC uh, structure. So if you're able to see there are traditional DMK vote banks and traditional ADM vote banks, that difference we have to understand. If you feel the northern part of Tamil Nadu, which, pro which uh, presently uh, composites of one years and uh, among the lead population per years, if you feel there's a strong plank still remaining, if you're able to take this color for the past, uh, say, uh, from 70s onwards till now, if you see the Congo region, which is a composite of uh, Gounders and sub uh, Arunandias, which also belongs to Sri Lanka's category, but traditionally where ADMK's would bank. And after advent of uh, caste dynamics play stronger role, uh, there were a lot of representation of uh, Devas in ADMK. So if you see the analysis of ADMK representation will be more of uh, Devas, uh, Gounders, and Arundhati population. And if you see more of uh, uh, Pallas, Vanyas, and Parias of DMK's old bank. If this analysis has been extrapolated, you will be able to see that the strong old banks, uh, especially in these bills. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, if you take a uh, CUSP constituency, mm -hmm. suppose, for example, if you take Chennai or any metropolitan, which is a composite of all caste and communities, there won't be a strong uh, caste uh, uh, factor playing a role in uh, giving uh, tickets to candidates. That's why you see a lot of leaders belonging to minority communities, uh, religious minorities, as well as atheists like me were able to participate in the election in regarding in Chennai ground. So what has made this uh, entire process, you have to understand that uh, ADMK and DMK, in order to win an electoral process, I have started in a what is in a competition type of thing to give a representation to backward class uh, mobilization and SC mobilization depending upon the population figures based in Tamil Nadu. Uh, we have to again thank uh, constitutionally Dr. Ambedkar for registering the uh, one third proportional uh, composition for Dalit communities, where by default both ADMK and DMK have to give through the reserve communities. So that as number has been fixed. Regarding the OBC mobilization, the traditional wood banks are now a sort of, uh, uh, what do you say, it is getting mixed up. For example, after 90s, after advent of uh, isolated one-year party like Patali uh, Makkal Kachi, or isolated predominantly public population of uh, even if they say it's a composite one, those alliances also played a role of the one-year representation in ADMK and DMK. Uh, mm -hmm. Alliance of uh, Pharma, PVMK in ADMK, an alliance of PMK with uh, DMK, and the proportion of one year representation in each and every party, post 90s especially, this was led. Uh, there's a good observation if you're able to find in 2021 election, the present election, uh, the traditional Arundhandiya road base, which was uh, ADMK's road base, switched over to DMK this time. 
if mm. you're able to study the cbnet study by hindu uh, if you say able, able to see the cast analysis among the sc population and the arunandir population there's a huge chunk of uh, migration of votes which were traditional vote banks of admk which switched to dmk you know mm. why because of inner reservation policy by dmk they gave inner reservation among uh, scheduled uh, caste in among the arunandiyas so many people got educate educationally empowered so if you are able to see the traditional uh, vote bank system is uh, like an assimilation of uh, obcs because the predominant uh, population here has been obcs and uh, dalit representation according to uh, confirmed by uh, constitutionally by dr ambedkar's intervention coming to the women's representation see uh, women's representation i understand we have a long way to go we have a long way to go regarding legislatures but you should also understand it was dmk who introduced the 33% reservation in uh, local body elections for women so it it is a step by step by evolution so and we need care. to have yeah it's evolution so we need to have more women representation that uh, the party has to evolve on that i i understand the the limitations here definitely uh, acknowledge the limitations here no no thank you and uh, actually i think we we agree on 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 most on most uh, on most things uh, there are examples you know uh, navin patnaik increased drastically the number of tickets to women candidate mamta banerjee also did it in the last general election so it's just a matter of political will to actually do it but uh, sanjukta yeah i think there is a question that is again tied to the whole question of dalit representation and emancipation and and how the dmk would actually respond to it uh, i mean we have seen um, erilyn actually talk of it briefly right now uh, but there there is another point that's emerging on the suffering of tamils in sri lanka which is i think another session another panel probably on, on in this context but i i would really like um andrew to to step in and perhaps sort of you know touch on the whole issue of religion which which is something that should come out from uh, this whole discussion of caste that that is extremely elaborately done uh, by you um uh, jill and i and i just feel that you know we have we have got a very complex picture which otherwise looks uh, as if you know the caste competition is is fairly simple but we can see how how it plays out electorally and and the geography is also interesting and it seems to me that some things don't move at all and perhaps the explanation of the geography can then be tied to the opportunities that are coming up in certain pockets of tamil nadu especially the role of private capital and how you know private capital plays out for these kind of caste mobilizations which appear to me quite static and the figures are rising in the admk slot as well as the dmk slot but it doesn't seem to me to be rising so sharply as the progress in the development of capital is so there you know the whole point of inequity that we were talking about earlier therefore exactly kind of ties up with um with with the same kind of you know there's the a stability of some caste positions and that is being reflected electorally as well uh, within within party politics and that kind of ties up with the questions of you know opportunities privilege inequalities and hence the question of pride politics playing in in different states and i think vijay baskar was saying you know you have to look at the larger picture of india as well as global politics and i feel the social narrative of uh, of pride which is kind of replace even entering caste politics uh, is 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 reflective of the these kind of static pictures that are also emerging uh, so you know some people feel left out as you said you know very small caste groups geographically are quite scattered and so they keep gaining position and whether these pockets of small caste groups are therefore able to galvanize in a different way or getting attracted to the to, to religion on platter is what i'm thinking now that you know who are these low, lower caste groups that are so fragmented are then are then probably flexible enough to be attracted to religion so what is the role of religion in caste mobilization so can we just uh, turn to andrew and and see if there is any answer coming from him so, i didn't expect it 
but I'm just hoping there will be some. some. Uh, uh, respected panelists, uh, I got an urgent Iran to attend. Sure. That's some minutes. Uh, yeah. I'll meet Aaron, you and more meeting. questions if I have, I will definitely make a note. The questions from the Q&A don't disappear. So, you know, uh, we will have a record of all that anyway. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your interventions. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Yeah, over to you, Andrew. Oh. <clears throat> lovely. Thank you ever so much, um, Sanjit uh, and Darren Adrian for organising um, the event. Um, Is this your uh, slide? Just to just yeah, to yeah it's just you, come you, up. You've I, stopped sharing. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, Thanks. hopefully it should be there. Um, I have to apologise for deviating from the title, so I don't have a huge amount to say about religion, but um, no, that's fine. I'll, I'll say a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think. And quite briefly as well about what I think the significance of the election is that it's just passed. First is just to remind everybody that that Kamnad actually did have a very significant political crisis um, in 2018, uh, 2019. Um, it wasn't clear how the ADMK was going to be led. And um, I think what the election shows in a sense that that, um, that the crisis has, has, has passed. Um, that um, Idipadi Planasami showed himself to be, you know, a competent um, uh, chief minister and leader of the party as well. Um, and so the sort of doubt that people had, you know, with the AA, AI ADMK survive, is, that question has kind of gone away for the moment. Um, likewise, the election is very important for the DMK. I mean, it, it suffered a very bad defeat in 2011. Um, Unusually, it didn't win back power in 2016, and uh, then there's a big question for MK Stalin, um, and you know he will be very satisfied with uh, how the election just uh, just just completed. So, in a sense, we kind of have a, a sort of turn back to political stability. Um, one thing I would say is that the election was very competitive, and, and and more competitive perhaps than people thought. A lot of people thought the DMK would win very easily. Um, it was tighter than people thought. And um, it's worth just emphasizing what that means in terms of parties. Four fronts contested the election. Okay, only two of them actually won seats. Um, between them, they included 36 political parties. Um, and then I think there are two other um, parties that we want to talk about as well. So that, I mean, that is a phenomenally large number of, 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 of parties. Um, <clears throat> and what you know why does this happen and, and why does it matter i think um it matters because um the existing political parties the, the dravidian political parties um while they're very effective at winning elections they're not completely talking to all of the uh, the, the needs of the wider population there are people that are not incorporated and this means amongst the electorate but it also means amongst ambitious politicians that they sometimes come to the conclusion that, that maybe they would be more successful to, to, to go it alone. Um, partly it's fed by the structure of alliance politics, that if you can demonstrate that you have a certain level of support um, by going it alone in a subsequent election, maybe you'll get a place in, in, in alliance and you'll get a few seats in, in the assembly and so on. Um, Overall, I think what I want to emphasize is that there's a degree of pluralism in, in the political system in, in Kamalnad. Narendra Submanyam has written about this in a really interesting way in his book about ethnicity and, and mobilization. Um, and I think it's interesting that that trend is still there at a time in which um, we see pluralism shrinking in, in other parts of India. So I think uh, the Tamil case is, is, is a really interesting one. Now, I just wanted to say something about the the elite of the DMK, and I'm talking about the DMK because they won the election. And so in, in that sense, we get a kind of more significant and interesting outcome. Um, it builds a lot on what Gila said. Um, uh, I think his point about the stable political class, about incumbency is really important. That those diagrams are really insightful and, and, and really, really interesting. Um, what I would say is, when Gilles talks about that stable political class, people that have won uh, three elections or more, um, what's really interesting is that these uh, political figures find their way into the cabinet. So the, the well-experienced political uh, district secretaries and so on are, are, are well represented. If you look at the uh, cabinet at the moment, it doesn't actually look in many ways that very different from the cabinet 10 years ago. Yes, there are new faces, but the senior cabinet ministers were 
cabinet ministers back in, in 2011. The big difference is, of course, that, that Stalin is, is, is the chief minister, mm. but um, you still have those kind of really important kind of heavyweights there, um, which is why I've put the kind of new cabinet in, in inverted commas. And then just to follow up on what Sheila said, um, in terms of representation, um, uh, there are only two women out of 34 uh, cabinet ministers. And if my count is correct, there are only three Dalits uh, out of 34. And in terms of the order of precedence, they're pretty well towards the, the, the bottom of it. So it's um, it's not a new trend, but, but the trend um, continued. The other thing that, that's really interesting for me um, is the background of the candidates. And again, I, the focus here is on, on the DMK. Um, and this is not the people who are elected, but it's the people that, that, that contested. Um, and if you look at the occupational profile, um, what is to be expected um, is that agriculture is, is, is very important. And in 2011, nearly half of the candidates said that um, they, they had some kind of connection with agriculture. Um, of course, they're all politicians as well, and, and there's a kind of curiosity here in how they report their, their, their occupations. But I think what is interesting is that their connections with different sectors of, of the economy. And what we're seeing here is not a very diverse uh, group of people. And, and what for me is very interesting is the way in which business has become more important as um, an area of activity in which politicians in, in, engage. and. Um, in 2011, about a third said that they had a connection with business. In 2021, it was nearly half, 44% said that they had a connection with business. Um, what I will also emphasize is that people do not always disclose their business connections. And so the figure actually in 2011 was well over 50%. Um, very often senior politicians hold, they, they own engineering colleges and they don't declare that. They, they just register themselves as social workers. Um, so I, I think it's safe to say in, in 2021 that, that the figure that the number of people involved in business will be will, will be higher again um, uh, once we kind of drill down into the data a little bit more. Um, so for me, that's really interesting that um, a, a lot of politicians have a double, triple um, career is um, in, in agriculture and politics and business. Um, and uh, there is a kind of nexus there that, that I think needs to be kind of unpacked a little bit more in, in, in scholarly work to think about the ways in which having a career in politics is also um, good for building um, a, a business career. Um, and that's all I'm going to say for the moment, but th thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's very, you know, that, that, that's that's very revealing. I feel that, you know, we are looking at um, a new kinds of opportunities probably arising from the agricultural kind of, you know, the trend that is, you know, farmers politics is happening at a time and, and the kind of farmers movement and protest that is happening in the north of India. Professor Vijay Bhaskar, you've talked extensively about the rural and the urban linkages. And now it emerges from Andrew's paper that, you know, that and there, is, there is a real growth uh, of agricultural entrepreneurs who are having to contribute into this kind of political climate as well as um, winning seats and, and, and our MLAs as well. So is there is there this you know this is something to be teased out as Andrew says that you know we we need to really look at what is going on in terms of the strength of this particular business community and also uh, Jill I wanted to then ask if that the, the growth of this kind of an entrepreneurial class in in the um, in the political scenario then matches with particular caste groups as well that are engaged with agricultural businesses and investments and who are the people who are there for gaining that upper hand and are and are contributing to this political stable class that you mentioned um, i think this will also tie up later I, with dharani dharan's intervention with you know you're you're going to bring in that kind of perspective uh, given your background in public policy and management uh, whether uh, this this new entrepreneurial motivation to enter politics is coming from a from a way of managing certain traditional sectors as we call it 
you know, agriculture is more kind of a traditional sector and whether new management practices, new kind of entrepreneurs are emerging from your own sort of feel and your own experience of public policy as well as program managements that you're in. We'll go, go to that later. Prabhu, do you have anything to add here from your own experience? The medical sector is very small. It's only what, 2% probably? We saw a kind of, there's not much intervention, but I don't think uh, there is anybody who's done similar analysis for another state to see if there is an increased presence of the, the more kind of established professional classes, the lawyers, the, the medical sector in politics. There hasn't been those kind of, I mean, the lawyers are quite powerful, say in Bengal, we've seen lots of uh, participation from there, but I don't know the figures of off the top of my head to to quote for Bengal. I mean, Prabhu, do you have anything to say? In I mean, all I wanted to say was, I mean, sorry, I mean, just like talking about the professional input, I mean, like only lately, I think like we are seeing like more professionals like coming into their respectives. I mean, one other yeah. important person not to be forgotten in this discussion will be the financial minister, current financial minister who has been in like, I mean, appointed by our, our chief minister. There can't be like no one like who could replace him in the discussions, like especially when it is goes on to the central government discussions. I mean, like those have been like, quite a dynamic discussions. And like we were also like, I mean, like we shouldn't really ignore the fact that like last time the health minister was a medical professional himself. So I think like lately the trend is coming up. Like, I mean, like I'm looking forward to more of these happening because I mean, I don't have comparisons in the other states, but like definitely for Tamil Nadu, this is a new trend which has been set up. And then like also like it was quite interesting to hear from Prof. Giles about the, how the mm -hmm. economic like background situations were like put in together about the professional background, how the variation in and then how that ties in with their kind of entrepreneurship, like what they kind of like disclose or not disclose. So there are a lot more kind of like which are hidden factors. I'm sure the pro, like the more professionals like who come forward into it, like that'll be like more forward like way of us going towards. Thank you. That's that. That's great. Um, I think uh, there is there is an interesting question uh, that um, that again, you know, touches on Professor Vasker's last point about mm -hmm. ecological justice. And I just have this feeling that uh, the intervention from the agrarian sector will also tie up with uh, questions of ecological justice and and how. Um, some some kinds of entrepreneurship from the agrarian sector also merges with the newer developments of on environmental politics as well. So the greening of electoral politics in terms of environment oriented, how is it that these are, you know, if these can be seen as clear trends in, in new political parties or the kind of people who are getting involved. So this question comes from uh, Professor Emeritus Nadaraja uh, Sriskandaraja, who's Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And I think it, it kind of you know, ties up well with Vijabaska's point. Um, there's another uh, emergence of another point from an anonymous person here. On the emergence of the Nam Tamilar Kachi, complicate the Dravidian mobilization. And do you think the NTK has hit its peak and would continue to stay as is or grow further? There isn't a particular question to a particular panelist. So I would open this up to anybody who would like to answer. Um, uh, and 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 let's let's sort of you know have some quick points. Vijay Bhaskar, would you like to say anything to to the points that Andrew okay. raised and the questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I mean, uh, that's uh, very interesting. The fact that uh, you know many of them uh, report agriculture as their mm -hmm. kind of one of their major sources of income. Uh, in, I, I would, I would be surprised if actually agriculture constitutes a major share of their income. Clearly, I think the bulk of the income should come from yeah. Uh, businesses. Yeah, and we do know. I mean. Uh, Two things. One is that the expenditure, election expenditure, you know, uh, at the national level has been increasing enormously since the 1990s, and clearly, uh, it's very obvious that only uh, candidates with a certain amount of money power can actually contest elections. Yeah, that has become uh, uh, very clear. That is one, and second, we also know that. 
uh, if you look at the kind of wealth generation at the all india level uh, a lot of wealth accumulation is essentially taken place in what are known as rentic sectors yeah uh, sectors where you derive uh, uh, money by controlling scarce resources and generating rents from that yeah and uh, and obviously that kind of control over those sectors come from proximity to uh, political decision making and uh, that must be true of all parties uh, uh, you know the real estate for example i mean you know uh, it will be very hard to come across uh, a real estate lobby which is not very closely tied to uh, political parties at this juncture so uh, i think that's uh, you know it's so that agriculture thing is something you know i kind of find it hard to believe to compare that they have lands but whether that constitutes a big source of income or something i would be uh, surprised if it is really true uh, on the question of this greening of electoral politics so one note of caution i would like to raise here is we know uh, green can also be saffron yeah can also go saffron we have seen how environmental movements at the all india level have uh, uh, also been suffused with a uh, large degree of uh, saffron so to that extent here, again it is uh, uh, even this uh, the greening you know uh, at, uh, you also see this tendency here we look at this organic farming movements and uh, in tamil nadu as well there is this uh, Uh, tie up to this idea of going back to a pure tamil way of farming and so on yeah it may not be a majoritarian kind of uh, uh, this thing but you know it's also tied to this idea of going back to reviving traditional varieties of seeds recovering uh, traditional ways of farming and so on which might be also tied to a politics of revival of an essentialist kind of identities which i think we need to watch out for and i'm afraid that the nam tamil kachi uh, tends to represent that dimension of uh, uh, the meaning of uh, politics i'll just stop here thanks that's great um andrew would you like yeah. to add anything to i'd like to add something um yeah So there is an interesting book written by Yuria Kaje professor Tian Spo she wrote this book called price of democracy she mm-hmm. observes that price of i mean the cost of fighting elections has been rising everywhere across the world not just india but most of the countries the countries which do not have proper reforms she says the example of india sorry of us germany and even france and she says the last 30 years is is rising by more than 300 400% that's why we have politicians like trump who are able to become um, uh, presidents and she also proposes that election funding should be public and how sh- how we model it is a question but that's that's what the book discusses about so i just wanted to add this in Sure. Um, Joe, did you want to say anything on yes, um, you know, the on, cast on the, lines? And... Yeah. So on the complex relation between uh, environmentalism and, and politics, I'm, I'm reminded that in 2014, the two candidates who had the highest number of, the, of criminal cases against them were two candidates from Tamil Nadu, from Amadmi Party, Mr. Pushparayan and Mr. Uh, Uday Kumar. Uh, who both of them are green activists you know figure and you know, uh, leading uh, leaders of the um, uh, the protest movement against you know the kudankulam uh, nuclear reactor uh, a leader of the anti starlight copper industry movement uh, and so forth so i think there's still a very long way uh, for environmentalism and electoral politics in india to sort of you know become friendlier than than they have been now on the question of you know this business of business in politics i think we need to make distinctions between several very different kinds of processes on the one hand the uh, the story of you know caste group turning entrepreneurial acquiring greater position within you know, big, big, you know in, in 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 trade networks and, and building a political identity and using that as a vehicle for political empowerment empowerment has long been documented i noticed that uh, professor barbara harris white is in the audience and she has written extensively uh, about um, about uh, about about that uh, the second distinction that needs to be made is between uh, the rise of a new class of entrepreneurial professional politicians which 
tend to get a lot of media attention uh, because of access, because also of their new character, and, and, and but uh, are still, you know, few in, in number, especially compared to this other larger category of business grounded politicians. People who invest in a political career to further some form of private interest, which can be individual, which can be group based, which can be a cross caste. I mean, it, it can take you know all sorts of configuration, and we usually come from uh, sectors of the economy that uh, are close to the state, are regulated by the state, where you need licenses and can public rely on public contracts, uh, where. Uh, sectors of the economy that also tend to be criminalized. That's me talking with my Uttar Pradesh lens uh, here. Um, and, uh, and also very competitive, right? And uh, if you add that with uh, what Danila said about you know, the rising costs of the cost of entry into politics, uh, you have structural incentives for people who have the resources to get into politics to get in. There's a selection bias, there's a selection effect, but there's also the production of incentives to sort of use and misuse these positions to further some form of private interest. And I'm not, I, I can't speak for Tamil Nadu, but I, I can speak for other states and North Indian states. Uh, these are usually your fly by night politicians, right? They, 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 they invest into politics, they get elected, try their best to make the most of it, and then they usually quickly disappear. Yeah, I think I think that was, you know, earlier we did talk a little bit, I think Professor Vijabhaskar, you you kind of raised the point about affirmative action in the in state and, and there's a there's a great amount of reduction in the public sector. So um, and it's been further eroded. And and I think the, these kind of measures as well as the new education policy, which is trying to club together these various tasks under one kind of group. Uh, you know, all this is also going to play into how the representation within parties would, would, would also shift and change because uh, there is a tendency to, to kind of almost equate the, the suffering of a, of a Dalit or a woman with the suffering of everybody. It just seems to me that, you know, the new education policy is is trying to bring things together and club everything together. And similarly, the, the whole issue of the state not being able to take control of affirmative action uh, is, is going to, again, have impacts on how caste mobilization will play out uh, eventually as well. So, so I think the, the national level policies are, you know, are obviously in dialogue with what is happening on the state level. But at the same time, we are looking at various fluxes in different quarters, whether it's smaller groups, smaller caste groups, or the changing nature of entrepreneurship in political parties, which is, which is coming out from uh, Andrew's paper. And that ties up with the erosion generally of the public sector and employment opportunities. So it's, it kind of crisscrosses with that. Do you have anything more to add? to um, employment and, and caste issues. Not now. really, except to say, yeah, not really, except to say that affirmative action, this domain itself has become extremely restricted uh, with this decline in public sector employment. There's no two ways about it. So now affirmative action essentially is in terms of education. And that's where I think uh, the problems of differences in quality uh, at the primary level or the tertiary level is likely to make a big difference. If we don't address that, this division, this is going to kind of, you know, uh, create new access of inequality. And as you rightly said, it is, of course, yes, there's a difference between backward castes and Dalits. But importantly, there are classes within all these castes. Yeah. Uh, there are elites across all these castes who are likely to get the benefit from what has happened in the last 20 years, uh, declining public sector employment and uh, reduce role for affirmative action. So that is kind of opening up as a big quality. And, and yeah. Tamil Nadu, I mean, it, it's, it's happening in all other states as well. But despite all this, you do find that the gap between, uh, in rural uh, Tamil Nadu, you find the reduction in the inequalities between Dalits and other castes. 
but in kind of urban tamil nadu the gap between dalits and backward castes on one hand and between backward castes and upper castes on the other hand it sometimes it's kind of is persisting you would expect that to kind of come down because of affirmative action policies and so on but you don't find that happening as much as one would expect and that has to do with what has happened in post 1990s in terms of the kind of skill sets you know that uh, labor market kind of was uh, brought into demand and so on That's, yeah jill if you want yeah. to add something uh, before yeah. we move to the next and uh, the final paper and wrap yes. up conversation yeah very quickly there was a question on the ntk the ntk is quite an interesting yeah. party oh, yes. it's the only party in india that actually gives 50 50% of women can it it's done so in yeah. two consecutive election and it's it's quite unique and it deserves to be mentioned now Uh, it's still a fairly localized phenomenon and they have grown they have got you know substantial vote share but they are growing in what you could call a residual space of electoral politics in tamil nadu so as such i don't see them as uh, having a lot of a major effect on uh, on tradition politics per se or on electoral politics between major players they basically have two directions in front of them either they basically stay on the side of the road and do their things and they will probably plateau and they may have plateaued already only the future will tell us or they get into uh, the game of negotiations with uh, dravidian parties become part of coalitions and 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 and, and they sort of peg their 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 performance to uh, to electoral alliances which i'm not quite sure that's something that they would do right now uh but it is an interesting phenomenon and uh and the gender aspect shows that you know uh courageous decisions don't always come from where you expect them to come that's great thank you so maybe on that note let's turn to the future the past present and future of dravidian ideology i think it kind of ties up very well with uh, some assumptions that we have and perhaps some speculations from you um selvam dharani dharan the co-founder of oxford policy advisory group if you want to uh, do your session now uh if you oh. have a powerpoint or anything to share or you know. uh, no 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 powerpoint yeah welcome sure. uh, good evening to everyone firstly i would like to thank uh, prabhu yourself and sos for organizing this uh, fantastic uh, panel discussion and you know it's always very difficult with the last speaker because such a <laughs> with such a great panel because most of the things that i want to speak are spoken so i'll try to avoid redundancy but still if i repeat uh, my apologies i think the futurist vision is quite important to just wrap things up we've had quite a lot of this um, yeah so anyway i'll just go about four parts so initially i want to talk about the election results briefly and then talk about reasons for the failure of the right wing uh, nationalist movement in tamil nadu and third thing would be was to why the sps and the bsps and the rjds failed uh, in comparison to the uh, dravidian parties and fourth the future of the movement as well as threat to the uh, movement so the uh, the one two and three would kind of also talk about the uh, past and the present so see the selection was an important election for the dravidian movement see realistically uh, dmk is the only uh, dravidian party at present i think uh, admk had been slowly uh, leaving his uh, dravidian tag and now with this alliance with uh, modi and the kind of policy that happened from uh, 17 to 21 and with no real dravidian leader i don't think area dmk is any more a dravidian party so dmk is only dravidian party so for dravidianism to succeed dmk has to succeed so dmk has not been in power for the last 10 years so it had to definitely win this elections probably it, it couldn't afford to lose the election for the third time a dmk being a party of um, of personality without uh, personality like amma mgr and anti incumbency they were not the favorites but still you know the uh, alliance with bjp and uh, how the institutions are losing their autonomy and the money power and and the issues on which it was uh, fought on it definitely not an easy election for example it was fought on religious fundamentalism in which the veil uh, veil yatra was taken to veil uh, murugan is a uh, tamil god and they're also trying to mobilize the hindus together and then then there was uh, tamil fundamentalism of the N- ntk so though um, ntk was is opposed to bjp but kind of they kind of discredit the dravidian movement so which in turn help the hindu mobilization so if you kind of discredit uh, the dravidian uh, dravidianism then bjp is the only gainer and second also we had makkal neethi mnm 
which was also against the BJP, but still was kind of uh, discrediting the Dravidian parties and corruption and so on and so forth. And third, there was caste fundamentalism. Uh, there, were th uh, there were three issues here. First, there was reservation given to uh, one years. So there was mobilization of one years. And plus, uh, because the chief minister candidate was a Gounder, there was mobilization of uh, Gounder voters. And third, also because of the uh, uh, development uh, among the uh, Dalits, there was an insecurity among the Vanias as well as some uh, rough patches with certain subcasts within the Gounder community. So these were the issues. So, so people thought it should be a swing, a swing election like Mr. Andrew White said, but it was clearly not. Uh, like uh, D uh, DMK managed to get 159 and its allies together. DMK got about 133. Surprisingly, uh, DMK's alliance partners, Congress and BCK got about 60, 65 to 75%. Uh, except for CPA, CPM, all the alliances did well. For, for ADMK, if you look, ADMK did really well. Only the alliances uh, left them down. For example, BJP and PMK, they contested about 40, uh, 40 seats together and just won eight, so about 20%. And also, if you look, uh, the vote difference between DMK and ADMK is only 6%. six percent. But if you look at the uh, closer picture, in DMK gained all over Tamil Nadu, but but ADMK lost everywhere except the Congo Belt. So for example, though the, uh, the victory margins in no uh, North, Central and other parts of Tamil Nadu was about, 10, about 9 to 10% for the DMK, uh, plus 10% in favor of DMK. Uh, ADMK only managed to gain uh, in, uh, in the West, West Tamil Nadu. So if you remove election results in West Tamil Nadu, I would definitely see it as an election in, in which DMK one it um, left, right, and down. So this comes to an inter interesting uh, inference that is AADMK going to be a regional party, a party that's going to mobilize only Gounders and going to have presence only in the Western region. So with the friction of OPS and EPS, like the, uh, the chief minister and the deputy chief of ADMK, so if, uh, if the deputy chief minister kind of, let's say, moves away from ADMK or starts his own party or, or merges with the BJP, there is a clear risk that a, a ADMK would only be a regional party with presence in West. If that happens, then there are also chances for right-wing mobilization or for BJP to uh, uh, come to power in, in Tamil Nadu. So apart from that, let me go further into why did right-wing movement uh, fail, in, uh, in, in, uh, fail in Tamil Nadu as of now? So at, even in West Bengal, they are a force to reckon with. But here, if you look, 2001, 2021, 2001, they got about uh, three or four MLAs, the BJP, that's in partnership with um, DMK. And now we are four in partnership with uh, a, uh, a DMK. So there is no increase in vote share. This is this has not happened anywhere, maybe slightly in Kerala, but apart from that, Tamil Nadu, I would say is unique. The reason being, I would say, is because of the equitable growth. And also, um, uh, they have also if, you, if you look, also BJP plays regional politics. Let's say they go in Uttar Pradesh, um, and uh, kill someone because of an assumption that he's carrying beef meat. And again, at the same time, the same B uh, BJP chief minister in Goa goes and protests because there's no good beef available. Same thing in Northeast. Uh, also, you see now BJP is protesting in Tamil Nadu, saying that, is, uh, that alcohol shop should be closed and they go and, and they want to open alcohol shops in Lakshadi. So, so these kind of uh, incoherent statements have worked. And how they try to do it is to hypnotize masses using fake news, misinformation, and then Hindu mythology, um, and then again creating xenophobia against a specific uh, religion. So why it doesn't work in Tamil Nadu is mainly because of equitable growth. So I've, I've lived across India from Delhi to Madhya Pradesh, um, Tamil Nadu, and traveled across India. I've seen the cr critical thinking and education is, is uh, primary education is very high in Tamil Nadu, and plus the inter internet penetration of 70% is one of the highest in, in India. So because of that, the flow of information happens really fast. If there is a fake news, and immediately within a few minutes, the, uh, the DMK party is able to respond to the same. So that's one reason. So I would say the growth enabled by Dravidianism ha has been helping Dravidianism to sustain. So maybe you can ask why other states not uh, able to do this. So that is something I'll come in uh, later uh, part of my essays. But again, if you look, the growth of Tamil Nadu is very unique. So Tamil Nadu is the only state in which it has achieved uh, success in both uh, 
socioeconomic development as well as in uh, in, in in industrial growth if you look at kerala they are number one in all the uh, socioeconomic metrics if you uh, uh, take gujarat or maharashtra they are number one in industrial growth but if you take a state which has come num- uh, in the top 3 in both it's only tamil nadu so so even within that if you look even within industrial development if you look tamil nadu is the only region where the industrial units are uh, spatially spread out so it's not only focused on the capital you take gujarat it's focused on amdabad a few few uh, or one or two cities but in tamil nadu it's it's everywhere chennai uh, tirupur koyambatur selam sivagasi vellore um, and because of that again as mr andrew white said um, the caste groups are spatially spread out so because of that all caste groups were able to uh, grow and this was also enabled by the infrastructure that was created by uh, the uh, dravidian movement as well as by access of uh, access on uh, education provided to all and also if you look with the uh, growth composition of the entrepreneurs i would say one and two uh, dalit entrepreneurs live in tamil nadu and about yeah majority of the uh, obc entrepreneurs uh, not are not smes from smes to uh, big corporate houses they are based in in tamil nadu in fact if you look at the uh, list of uh, india's top 100 richest people you would see the list is probably 98% 99% uh, two upper castes or three upper castes but the one only the, the there will be few names three or four names and those who represent the obcs and those names would be from tamil nadu and even if you look at uh, uh, per cap so you may argue that per capita growth in gujarat and maharashtra is high, higher than tamil nadu so the co- counter argument for it is in there you find 10 or 15 really big corporate houses and most of the income is concentrated in their hands and because of that you you see the uh, per capita income is very high the average income is high but not the median income so if you if you compare gini index i have been looking for the gini index for states in india which is something i did not get but i'm very sure tamil nadu would have a very low gini index and uh, gujarat and maharashtra have a very high gini index so um, christopher jeffrole in his book um, uh, caste politics says that caste in india is like tightly knit cylinders and each cylinders are floating in the uh, inside a bubble so even if the country is uh, growing it's only that one cylinder is going to get all the Uh, growth and other cylinders are completely isolated so tamil nadu is the, i would say tamil nadu is the only place where um, all these cylinders are intertwined and um, so there's, there's another uh, rhetoric that's put forward by people who hate dravidianism they say no 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 the reason for growth of um, uh, uh, tamil nadu is not dmk or admk it is kamaraj but what we will forget is kamrajer was in power for 5 to 7 years and the reason why kamrajer came and became chief minister of tamil nadu he was the first obc to be chief minister of any indian uh, indian state was because of the dravidian movement because the dravidian movement and dmk were uh, becoming really powerful congress wanted and um, and uh, and someone from obc community and none other than nadar was uh, made as a chief minister and again when congress was in power or most of the agenda was set by both dravida kalakam as well as the dmk they played a major role in agenda setting for example if you remember the uh, first uh, the chief minister of tamil nadu wanted to bring uh, education based on um, on um, what do you call uh, on their family uh, family occupation which is again kulakalvi was a kulakalvi in tamil so again it was promoting casteism it was again only because of the protest by dmk that was kind of uh, uh, annulled so there was there's been great role played by the movement even before uh, india gained independence so if you look the movement is 50 to 60 years old before they came to power so you can also ask me a question so if you say um, such dmk was responsible dmk or admk was responsible for growth of tamil nadu why the same did not happen in uttar pradesh bihar where you have a same movement even the movement was stronger plus they also had india's first dalit chief minister so even uh, the famous researcher amit ahuja in his recent book talks about though there is more muslim mobilization up bihar and tamil nadu economic growth did not happen or ch- or uh, changes in education fulfillment or fundamental uh, social economic growth did not happen so there are primarily three reasons for it 
So the first reason is they were not able to manage a common uh, consensus, like Professor Vijay Bhaskar was earlier uh, explaining. So the horizontal consolidation was not very easy. Each of them have their uh, own caste pride and their own aspirations. And also within the caste, there's all, like, I mean, in the sense, uh, even uh, if you say, uh, let's say one, uh, one year are uh, jealous of the counters and counters are jealous of uh, the caste above them. So, so those kind of frictions. So in Tamil Nadu, because of Justice Party, DK and DMK and also Periyar, they were, because of their efforts for the last 50, 60 years, they were able to mobilize people all together against one common uh, group of people, that's uh, Brahmins. So this created the social cohesion. And second thing is the most important, that is administrative reforms, which was done both by uh, the movement, Justice Party and DK, as well as by the DMK. So this um, reforms in the bureaucracy increase the capacity of the state to execute and deliver to the demands of the regular people, uh, private sector, as well as the businesses. And the first and the most important thing which uh, DMK did when they came to power was to remove uh, rural positions based on hereditary and caste, and, and again, de-elitization of uh, bureaucracy. So for example, uh, I also run this think tank called Dravidian Professional Forum, which was founded by uh, the Honorable Minister for Finance, PTR Palivel Tyagrajan. So we had the senior uh, ex-bureaucrat, Mr. Narayan, who was in charge for uh, setting up midday meals in India. He came and spoke to us. And he was saying that one of his junior officers who had actually implemented midday meals along with him was hired by um, World Bank. And it was a fire assignment. He wa they want to do the same thing, improve the capacity like in Tamil Nadu, in West Bengal, uh, and states like Orissa, his 90s. And he tried hard for five years and failed. And Narayan says the reason was ethos. The officials were not in sync with the demand of the population. So in Tamil Nadu, what they did was they were able to link the bureaucracy with social justice through preservation and also via uh, de elitization. So, which what I mean is people from all walks of life were brought into bureaucracy. If you, if you even now if you look at chief engineers of Tamil Nadu, of every department, they, they will represent every caste in the state. Or if you go to a northern state, most of the officials you would see from uh, very few elite, uh, elite caste. So because of that, they had empathy. So that because of the empathy, they were able to understand uh, the needs of people belonging uh, to their, uh, their caste. And because of this, people are also easily able to walk to a taluk office or a block office or, an off, uh, or, uh, or basically even to collector's office and demand their rights. And another most um, Im uh, important thing was the organization structure. So when DMK had an organization of district uh, secretaries who was equivalent to a collector and then uh, a an, uh, village, uh, village panjayated. So because of these, these people kind of worked in parallel to the bureaucracy. So sometimes they worked, in, uh, they worked to fulfill the aspiration of uh, their constituents. So there's also uh, there's a study by Mr. Uh, Wine. Uh, uh, I think he, he made a study uh, around India and he also spoke to people and he was very curious why India had to create institutes like IITs and IIMs. IITs, IIMs for a country like India, which, which probably takes about uh, 0.5 or 0.1% of students, why should they spend so much money? Because those money could have been spent on primary education. And then he, he says in the study that because all the decision makers belong to the, uh, the topmost community, the Brahmin community, they were not able to understand the aspirations of the, the broader uh, broader segment of Indians as a whole. And that's the only reason why instead of spending on primary education, huge amount of money was uh, setting, uh, setting up of these institutions. And also there's this another interesting book by Mr. Uh, Vivek was on delivering public services in um, Tamil Nadu where he, where he travels across India and says um, that uh, Tamil Nadu and Kerala are two unique states when it comes to delivery of public services. And he says the same reason of how uh, the empathy among the officials is the reason. And third point would be the role of Justice Party. So Justice uh, created his manifesto in 1927. And uh, so the first and, and other things they did in the manifesto was to uh, ban schools that did not uh, accept students from uh, lower caste, remove, revoke permits for bus licenses for buses that, that refused to take people belonging to inferior caste, 
um and then also for the first time in india they had the industrial policy in so no state had industrial policy unless until uh, justice party came and introduced the same so what industrialization did was help in uh, it helped in rapid urbanization so what rapid urbanization did was move people to urban areas so village is the place where all the uh, caste hierarchies are really hard or uh, really strong so because people uh, kind of move to urban areas that also helped in uh, in reduction of caste hierarchies so even now if you look both dmk and admk have throughout um time work to fulfill the policy of party manifesto look dmk played a major role in promoting uh, msme we are starting sitcot sitco and uh, and also admk under mgr uh, expanded the mid meal started by the justice uh, party so so then another misnomer i wanted to talk about is freebies so i think the term doesn't exist the, so there have been a lot of criticism saying both dmk and admk uh, are uh, squandering the uh, public money by giving freebies so i think it's not a freebie it's not a term so recently a leader announced 4000 rupees to uh, to each person who needs it and again there were articles written which said oh these are freebies but these are not freebies these are given to people in need these are given to people who make less than 5 dollars a day or 4 dollars a day or 3 dollars a day so it's basically simple economics you put money in hands of people who don't have it the economy goes economy will definitely grow and also they said no 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 trickle down economy will work so they should focus only on the industries but in a stratified society like india trickle down economy will definitely not work unless you could unify and make them unitary in fact even in a comparatively unitary society that is the us trickle down economics has not worked from 1980s until now inequality has grown really big so again another uh, criticism which was made even now it is being made is uh, giving free color tvs which was seen as uh, blatant corruption but a research paper that was published by few research i forgot their name i'm sorry uh, published by oxford university press clearly says that giving the uh, color tv along with access to cable tv empowered women the most they compare the study with uh, compare uh, tamil nadu uh, city in brazil as well as kenya they say when women started watching uh, uh, tvs more they they were able to get the aspiration of the women in the cities they were they refused being beaten up by the husbands more they kind of also wanted to put women children in school so enrollment of women school uh, women children increased drastically so uh, so if going to the future of the movement i would say future of the movement will now depend on how dmk performs because dmk is the only party and how we manage the resources and there are also other constraints which uh, we did not have earlier um which we did not have uh, earlier such as we have a really strong uh, bjp government and and they want they want to create uh, one state one language and one culture and every day we see new policies as coming and uh, that's kind of fitting federalism so thank uh, vijay baskam mentioned gsts are have completely stopped states autonomy to tax goods and again we are dependent on the central government for money so if the relationships are not good the money is not going to come already states finances are really bad shape i think it's 5.7 lakh crores plus about uh, another 3.3 lakh crores about 9 lakh crores are debt which is i would say about 100 billion euros so that's the another problem um plus we have interference in education such as neat uh, so for example the reason why tamil nadu has one of the uh, best healthcare system is because we didn't have an computer exam it was through a simple 12th exam and also the 12th board was easier so it was it was equal for everyone so because of that we and also there was reservation across caste lines and also reservation for students studying in government schools and students from rural areas because of this we had doctors from uh, every region and this enabled spatial distribution of doctors in fact even norway is uh, struggling to uh, find doctors in remote regions of uh, norway so in tamil nadu that wasn't a problem because of the c entrance exams are definitely beneficial to the elites 
and in poor country like india are definitely going to favor the rich so then you have you know have poor are going to be marginalized so poor means lower caste so which means which means there is not going to be special distributions of do- uh, special distribution of doctors in fact i studied in sciences po so the elite uh, french school for where uh, most of the uh, french students who want to be uh, presidents uh, they they go and study so even sciences po last year cancelled the entrance exam saying it only promotes elites to join so only elites get into the public service so for if it's the same for a country which is so low in gini index and so unif- um, so um, and and has a very high per capita gdp so for india then entrance exams are definitely discriminatory so now we don't have the uh, relaxation even with the national education policy there's a lot of interference in um, in education and another thing that's going to hinder uh, our policies is uh, is is increase in growth via uh, private sector companies so now growth is propelled via private sector companies so we can't provide affirmative action and so there is again some caste might be left out and if another example of uh, touching uh, government institutions or universities in tamil nadu is is how uh, the central government wanted to take anna university and make it into an institute of eminence so these things are definitely going to uh, make uh, make uh, things very difficult for dmk and also to uh, take the movement very forward so so the so other thing which a movement can work is to m- make it more inclusive for women if if you uh, hear mr vernia speak he spoke about how there are very less women in uh, within the dmk so that could be one aspect and second aspect is also youth if you look at number of uh, mlas with less than age of 45 minimum so these are the two things which a party should focus on to uh, and also to cater to the aspirations of uh, these categories so i would like to conclude by saying um, whatever india tries to do it can achieve growth only by ha- uh, trying to make every community grow that's to by providing e- equitable growth so so the only way or only uh, way possible for whole of india to grow is the tn model so whatever the structural reforms we make until we make sure that money is not concentrated in the hands of the few we will not be able to uh, grow so with this i would like to end thank you thank you very much um, harani dharan for your overview of uh, you know um <clears throat> yeah okay uh, yeah i mean <clears throat> we've had we've you know you've given this this big long kind of picture as to where the dmk proposes to move and obviously there are areas where mobilization would get uh, possibly stronger in the coming years given the way the political dialogue is moving to attract the youth in climate justice ecological justice and those kind of newer areas of intervention and and also you talked about how women's participation can uh, be increased through new technologies possibly access to technologies so it's really you know you're bringing back the whole point of uh, increase access and expand areas of access and therefore engage with uh, a more inclusive dialogue um you also obviously shown this uh, you know the the, the long term um very unique uh, tamil nadu's position of uh, building this kind of caste solidarity that is not just about individual castes but to question constantly the elitism within the caste movement and how the lower caste groups have have mobilized along those lines i think that's that's another um, area that can then strengthen uh, some some uh, new environmental movements or new areas of the economy and with that i want to highlight uh, a particular question that has been raised by professor barbara harris white from oxford university where she talks about uh, waste economy and how modernity means waste and waste is the fastest growing economic sector though you wouldn't know because there are no data Uh, as she says but waste is regarded as a tech engineering sector with shgs ngos added to the sambhar but it's a caste problem the upper castes who act as those entitled to throw waste 
It is a huge sector still dominated by SCs and STs and local tax evasion starves municipalities of the finance needed to deal with waste. So you have rampant privatization and contractualization in which the conditions of work and the incomes of those who deal with waste has nosedived dramatically in recent times. So the informal economy is now essential to Tamil Nadu's urban and increasingly rural cleanliness. So if Tamil Nadu's politics still stands for social justice, why don't you lead India and clean up waste? I think it also ties up with organizing decent work conditions, uh, recycling issues, as well as the youth politics that we were talking about, and new areas in which this can be tied with entrepreneurship, technology, as well as growth in some form. So um, that's, that's one uh, point that probably ties up with your manifesto of where DMK could, could uh, move. And there's also some other points that um, I think the whole issue of education, we've already discussed what, what NEP is trying to do and what difficulties therefore NEP can pose for the DMK. Uh, I think the other questions we've more or less touched. I can't see anything else at the moment in the question panel. Uh, so if there's, um, Darren, Darren, you have to leave. Perhaps the question is quite general. And um, I think anybody who in the panel, uh, Professor Vijay Bhaskar, if you want to say anything on waste economy, uh, or Andrew, if you want to say anything, or Prabhu, if you have any points to add to already what Darren, Darren had said, then we can just wrap up the session from there on. <clears throat> Anyone from yeah, the panel? I, yeah. I don't have anything to say, okay. except I, I mean, I agree with Barbara saying that uh, waste economics is definitely tied to task segmentation of the labor market. And uh, it is by and large, it's kind of invisible. Uh, but my only thing is, it has always been the case. I, I would, it would be difficult for me to make the case that things have got worse now. Uh, that may not be quite, except the fact, the intensity of the amount of waste generation, the amount of labor that is kind of involved in uh, cleaning up this has probably increased. But uh, apart from the fact that there has been a contractualization happening, uh, of workers within sanitation departments of urban local bodies. Even when they were there, there was a large amount of informal waste pickers operating simultaneously. So, yeah, I mean, I would... I mean, do we shift, do, do we see any shift in Dalit enterprise around waste economy? I mean, I just... You do find that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You do find uh, Dalit enterprises emerging, uh, especially in smaller towns. Uh, in uh, waste disposal, uh, especially mechanized waste disposal of human waste, particularly, I've seen that happen, and you know, so, so, and other things happen as well. But they're all small scale. Uh, see, the, the thing about capital, I mean, uh, it is uh, driven by caste, right? I mean, the, we know access to capital has been uh, uh, suffused with caste all along, and. Uh, uh, you, you, so, what is kind of visible is this more immediate uh, kind of relationship between uh, caste and capital at the local level and the regional level, not just about the elite, even about backward caste and the kind of alliance between political elites and, you know, uh, rentic sectors and so on. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is, seldom do these businesses become big. Very rarely, you know, except for this uh, very small phase uh, in the post 1990s, where you had business groups like GMR, GVK, and IBRCL from Andhra Pradesh, you know, bigger, uh, moving from the domain of provincial uh, accumulation to relatively pan Indian kind of accumulation. You don't find any businesses actually kind of uh, competing with this established big business groups. And, and established big business groups are all, uh, again, uh, relatively. Uh, not relatively, they're all upper caste or in traditional mercantile communities. So this uh, thing, uh, this capitalist, it's not just labor, but capitalists also, you know, extremely conditioned by uh, caste 
hierarchies and extent to which people from lower caste, capital from lower caste can actually become big or pan Indian is, seems to be very, very difficult and much more so in the current days. Sure. I'll just stop there, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think overall we have, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of raised this whole point of, you know, why BJP is, is also still not quite performing in the well in the states. What are its own obstacles? And and we can see that uh, you know the DMK has capitalized on some points. Its its manifesto obviously tries to uh, you know rope in as many differences as possible, but also create that kind of an inclusive agenda within its very progressive uh, manifesto to to tide over all these various divisions. But on the other hand, the, 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 the central government is also trying to, through its, say, new education policy, or to remove affirmative actions, or through its, its own measures, there is this drive, there's a social narrative that, you know, less of state intervention in determining property relations, in, in cutting back um, on, on dictating social norms, Etc. So there, there is that there is that thing that you know the the state is unable to control these things. So that that kind of will always remain the challenge, and that will always remain the struggle for states. I feel, and apart from that, BGP has its own kind of top level poor uh, state performance because of its own limitations of local leadership or its poor performance of the economy and particularly in the pandemic context, you know, the, the, the difference between state management and central management or the disputes around who manages the vaccine, the vaccine nationalism itself uh, is, is showing these kind of fractures and, and divisions quite clearly now. So within, within all this, you know, how would we situate any overarching debate that is now nationally many people are talking about, is this a failed state? So if the center is a failed state, how would the states then respond to anything? I don't think it's a failed state, but some people are sort of saying, could be this potential failed state. So this image, does it actually help or does it actually fuel the state center relations in a different direction, you know, given the kind of larger national picture? And particularly with Tamil Nadu, where the emphasis is on Dravidian ideology and this whole grassroots movement that it's that that is quite strong there, and it tries to um, you know build on that and move forward. So on the one hand, there is a strong grassroots movement. On the other hand, there is that kind of top-down measures that are constantly coming, and I think that's where the challenge would be for DMK to tide over. So, are there any final comments from? The panel. Uh, these are my thoughts that I've seen from the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. I, I would. <clears throat> I just will bring two things together. So I'm kind of really interested in the state cabinet, and um, what strikes me as really interesting is that that I'm not sure that MK Stalin stands above the cabinet in quite the mm -hmm. way that his father did, um, and I don't think that's necessarily problematic. And I, I just mentioned something that MSS Pandian wrote. Um, about six years ago, in which she talked about Narendra Modi and the politics of decisionism, that a lot of people superficially are very attracted to Modi's decisiveness. And I think what we know six years on is um, you can be decisive and, and frankly talk complete nonsense, and, and it's not helpful. And you, <clears throat> you have to evolve a kind of plural style of politics mm. in which you know, you devolve delegate responsibility to other, um, you know, cabinet colleagues, to your very, very able civil servants and so on. And, and this is the problem with the centre, is that Modi just doesn't trust people around him and, and expertise and so on. And I think that's part of the problem, you know, where we're at. It's not, it's as true of the economy as it is of the response to COVID. So plural politics it doesn't look very attractive and people can mock it as kind of policy drift and all the rest of it. But but actually, I think India in many ways is a very mature state and, and politically very mature. And, and, and sadly, in the last six years, we've kind of rolled back from that, I think. Uh, and, and I think Tom Nadd is interesting because still there's a sense in which this kind of pluralism is there. It's, it's not perfect by any means, but it is... Um, you know, it's it's how politics works. It, it, you know, it's complicated. Yeah. And it's it's messy. 
Yeah, we have one or one or two minutes left for any one or two statements from all of you. Uh, Jill, do you want to quickly? Yeah. Add? No, I mean it, it. It it is excessive to you know speak a language of failed state. I mean there was state failure uh, uh, certainly. Uh, I mean having lived through it, you know, I, can, I can attest to it. But you know you can't really say that the public health system collapsed because it was not equipped to deal with the situation you know in the first place. Well, it was not allowed to you know equip itself um, to to deal with um, deal with the situation. As far as the center state relation is concerned. Uh, I think the attempt of the BJP is to, you know, deal with each and every state individually, uh, and 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 try to avoid uh, the formation of an opposition front that would necessarily come from regional formations. And what we've seen over the past few months, it's more and more, you know, regional parties or regionalist parties um, uh, talking to one another and uh, expressing themselves in concert and and basically planting the seed of a future. Uh, opposition front. And so the more uh, the BJP and the government pushes, you know, on the button of you know, centralism and, and, and unilateral decisions and, and trampling on, you know, state's prerogative and so forth, the more it's going to push all those uh, party leaders um, together. And the fact that you don't have immensely towering figures, you know, um, is actually conducive to building, you know, coalition that I would hope to at least be a little bit functioning uh, sure. like what has been seen in the past. And so uh, so the next few months are going to be really interesting. Sure. Sadly, everything is going, the focus is going to turn on UP. Uh, so uh, everything is going to be, you know, about that. But I would really urge everyone to keep looking at what's happening in the state that just went to the poll, uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think uh, I, I want to tell the audience that, you know, we're going to keep this kind of conversation rolling, uh, bring more comparative examples and, uh, you know, look at more specific questions of leadership. The caste question is obviously quite big and broad and so diverse. And the interesting thing from this panel is that, you know, there isn't um, there isn't that that understanding, which is quite holistic about caste, but also how it connect specifically to electoral performances, leadership questions, uh, ability to, uh, to, to create a consensus around certain groups within the caste, and also the practice of elitism and questioning elitism from within. So a lot of these uh, issues came up very well. Uh, Prabhu, if you have a, another line to add, and then we wrap up with Vijay Bhaskar and then finish this. I just wanted to say, I think like there has been two themes like which I feel kind of been repeated and like that was in my mind was like one is health and education inequalities and mm -hmm. other one is about inclusion. And like so far, obviously, like it has been like only five weeks like since the new government has come into place yeah. and there was a lot of expectations. And I'm hoping like once the COVID situation is like better, I'm like looking forward to see more of like the clarification of their stand and this being sure. justified. Thank you. Vijay Bhaskar, there is a point about anti-intellectualism. Uh, you know whether uh, that is that that is going to be the trend, or do you feel you don't want to answer that and leave it for another time? Anti-intellectualism in Tamil Nadu. Yes, um, <clears throat> I think okay. the point is about prevailing and growing anti-intellectualism in both Dravidian and Central parties. There isn't a fine distinction here, but I think anti-intellectualism is is a trend in, 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 in other parts of this world. It's a kind of a global question perhaps as well. I don't know, but I was thinking that recently, especially if you look at the Lok Sabha elections, I think there were write-ups in the newspapers about how uh, the series of uh, literary articles uh, and also the intellectuals of different kinds were caught in the uh, Lok Sabha. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, yeah. I'm not a thing. I mean, definitely lessons seem to be the case. I don't think that's uh, that true. But having said that, yeah, I mean, as I mean, as states always have they always been looked at intellectuals for support? I don't know. Uh, probably would have gone in. So the point about the center state relation right now is, yeah. is is to kind of keep watching and looking at more comparative uh, prospects here. And uh, of course, the pandemic and the response is going to shape quite a lot as to how we look at reconstruction. 
as well as leadership questions. And uh, we look forward to uh, more sessions like this. On that note, I want to thank uh, Professor Vijay Baskar for being with us, Andrew Abayat to stay this long, and um, um, <clears throat> also Dr. Vernier to be with us, Prabhu Rajendran as well. Thank you also for your participation and being here. I think our other speakers have now left and uh, I want to wrap this up and, and a very good evening to all of you. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs>